Abraham, Abraham, Abraham.
Hello, check sound. Tapi teks ini apa kan Pak? Ya. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the hybrid conference. We will start the opening ceremony at 7.55 p.m. Thank you for your attention.
Ladies and gentlemen, we cordially invite you to prepare yourself. The ceremony will begin in a few minutes. Thank you for your attention. Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganefri PhD. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society.
The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards, and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama saya Maria Adeline Doroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. Mabuhay, UNP! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international student here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama saya Maria Adeline Doroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. Mabuhay UNP! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international students here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
the Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang, Professor Galepi. Honorable Vice Rector of Academic Affairs of Universitas Negeri Padang, Associate Professor Revnaldi. Honorable Vice Rector of General and Finance, Professor Sahril. Honorable Vice Rector of Student Affairs, Associate Professor Hendra Sharifuddin. Honorable Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Associate Professor Yul Kifli. Honorable Vice Deans of Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. Honorable Head of Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Associate Professor Budi Octavia. Respectable our keynote speakers in this international conference. Keynote speaker, Associate Professor Mageswari Kartudewan from University Science Malaysia. Professor Li Yukeng from University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Professor Halim Kusuma Atmaja from Durham University. Assistant Professor Romel Hidayat from Sejong University. And Professor Indang Dewata from Universitas Negeri Padang. Honorable our invited speakers. Associate Professor Heri Satria from Universitas Lampu. Associate Professor Yerima Desi from Universitas Negeri Padang. And Dr. Riga from Universitas Negeri Padang. Excellencies, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third international conference on chemistry and science education. The theme of the conference is Advanced Materials Science Synthesis and Green Chemistry for the Benefit of Future Generations, Cutting Edge Research of Chemistry and Science Education in Renewable Energy, Health and Sustainability Development. I am Siti Sara and I feel honored to be the master of ceremony for this conference. This conference is organized by Department of Chemistry, Universitas Negeri Padang. Ladies and gentlemen, the keynote session will be start at 9 a.m. until 3.30 p.m. Western Indonesia time. Ladies and gentlemen, to start the event, listening to the national anthem, Indonesia Raya, the audiences are pleased to stand.
Mr. Reza Akmar to lead the prayer. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Let us hold down our head as to the God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beg his blessings for each for today's conference. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the praying session, for those whose religion is other than Muslim, please adjust these prayers to your own belief. And please let me lead these prayers in Islam ways. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu asrafil anbiya iwal mursalin walhamdulillah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajmain Dear God today October 13 2022 in this beautiful place we gather here to hold international conference on chemistry and science education Please let this international conference as a medium to share knowledge, ideas, and beneficial experience for our life. To enlarge our horizon, to radiate our thought, and to lead us to become productive and successful person to lift up our nation's pride. Dear God, please assist and bless our heart and mind with your life and guidance. Please set your ways for our activities and help us utter clearly. Help us in order to listen patiently, respect each other, love each other, so we belong to the blessed people. Oh Allah, protect us from the unwanted plans. Show us the right things are right and the wrong things are wrong. To the right things and avoid the unpleasant ones. Rabbana taqabamina inna ka anta sami'ul alim. Wa fil akhirati asana wa kina azab al-nar. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamu ala mursalin. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alam. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Before the next agenda, please enjoy the performing Tari
first agenda, welcoming speech from the chairman of the third international conference on chemistry and science education. Please welcome Dr. Rernat Deskiberi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <clears throat> First, I would like to greet the keynote speakers, Professor Halim Kusumat Maja from Durham University, United Kingdom, Professor Lee Yok Heng from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Professor Magiswari Kerpundevan from University Science Malaysia, Assistant Professor. Ramel Hidayat from Sejong University, South Korea, and Professor Indang Dewata from Universitas Indonesia, Universitas Negeri Padang, Indonesia. On this occasion, I would like also to greet Rector and the Vice Rectors, Universitas Negeri Padang, Dean and the Vice Deans, the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, the head of Institute of Research and Community Service, the head of Institute of Educational and Training Development, Universitas Negeri Padang, the head of Quality Assurance Council, Universitas Negeri Padang, the head of Planning, Finance, and Academic Bureaus, the head of International Relation and Affairs, the head of Secretary, the head of and the Secretary of Chemistry Department. Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, Universitas Negeri Padang, distinguished delegates and participants. Ladies and gentlemen, first, I would like to greet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most compassionate and the most merciful, and bless and greeting to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is a great, great pleasure to welcome you to the third International Conference on Chemistry and Science Education, ICCHSE, at Universitas Negeri Padang. As the conference team for this second for this third year is Advanced Material Science Synthesis and Green Chemistry for the Benefits of Future Generation, Cutting Edge Research, Cutting Edge Research and Chemistry, and Science Education in Renewable Energy, Hall and Sustainable Development Goals. We invite academics, researchers, professionals, practitioners, observers, teachers, and students to present their current research in chemistry and related fields, as well as current issues in natural science education to join us in this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Inda take us on the adventurous journey through our marine life which is currently very vulnerable to microplastic pollution. Therefore, we need to make a serious effort to reduce them to preserve Indonesia's rich and popular marine potential. The statistics on the pollution of our ocean are worrying for sustainable living in the future. Professor Lee Yok Heng will then introduce us to, the long life, to his long life experience in the application of acrylic materials as biosensor membranes. Although the use of acrylic materials, materials as biosensors have been known for many years, it has recently gained momentum, especially in the synthesis of two-dimensional and three-dimensional biosensor membranes for the analysis of formaldehyde, nitrite, and other addictive compounds in, in foods. The sustainability of chemistry education in the future excites us all. And Professor Mageswari will open new, horiz new horizon of how chemistry education and experiments should be carried out in the present, in the present time and the future times. The concept of green chemistry experiments based on activity theory can be developed by teachers for sustainability progress in the future. 
Next, Professor Romeli Hidayat will introduce us to the process of synthesizing material, nanomaterials by using atomic layer deposition. Instead of working in the laboratory, Rommel will show us how computational chemistry allows us to simulate the physical properties of the expected result. Finally, Professor Halim, Halim Kusumat Maja will talk about the importance of water as the source of life on Earth and the interaction between liquid, liquid and solid, solid surfaces that can inspire us to understand the importance of water. Today's conference has about 310 participants, which consists of 94 participants registered as a presenter and 216 participants as non-presenter from several countries, namely South Korea, Malaysia, India, and Tanzania, and certainly from some universities in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to take responsibility as the general chair and work together with the pro prodigious team. Therefore, allow me to express my deep gratitude to all committees who have worked hard to, in to organize the third international conference on chemistry department, Universitas Negeri Padang. Lastly, we hope that this event will, able, will be able to strengthen, strengthen cooperation and networking between researchers, participants, and institutions. Finally, I apologize if there is any if there is any undesired in this conference due to the limitation of the committees. Thank you very much, and we look forward for the participation of presenters and institutions in the next ICGH SE in the future. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the speech by the chairman of the conference. The next agenda will come in speech from Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science. Please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Yuki Kli. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Honorable Rector and Vice Rector of Untas Negeri Padang. Honorable Vice Deans of Mathematics and Natural Science Faculty. Head of Graduate Program, Head of Department, and Head of Study Program of Mathematics and Natural Science Faculty. Distinguished keynote speakers and invited speakers, organizing committee and respectable participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has been giving us blessing and mercies to weekend attend this conference in a good condition. Salawat and salam are always given to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam peace be upon him. I am delighted to have this opportunity to greet you in the third international conference on chemistry 
and Science Education, ICTXSE, which will be held in the auditorium of Tas Negri Padang, West Sumatra, Indonesia, which is hosted by Chemistry Department, Faculty of Mathematics, Natural Science, Universitas Negeri Padang. ICCXSE is the fourth out of five conferences which is held by Mathematics Natural Science Faculty. I want to express my single gratitude to the Rector and Vice Rector of Tas Negeri Padang, as well as to all of the keynote speakers who greatly accepted our request to share their knowledge and experiences in a rank of field of expertise in this conference. We encourage researchers, scholars, as well as in academicians from IFRG of backgrounds to share and publish to the funding of their research in chemistry and related field as well as current issues in science education, chemistry, biology, and physics. Further, ITGSE will surface as a place for us to create partnership for potential future work and exchange new ideas. The conference will be implemented in hybrid mode as a result of the new normal, allowing all speakers to participate without being concerned by time or space. Hopefully, this conference will contribute for according innovation, reset in chemistry, and related field as well as current issues in science education with the time, advanced material synthesis, and growing chemistry in education for the benefit of future generation, cutting edge research in chemistry and science education for renewable energy, here and sustainable development. The organizing committee has been work very hard. I would like to thank them for their dedication, time, and effort. Finally, we respectfully request that this event be formally opened by the Tas Negeri Padang Rector. Please enjoy the conference. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the speech by Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science. The next agenda, welcoming speech and opening from Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang, the true presence by Vice Rector of Academic Affairs. Assalamualaikum Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirrohmanirrohim Salatu wassalamu ala asrafil anjiyal mursalim Wa ala alihi wa sabihi rasulullahi ajma'in Asyadu ala ilaha illallah Wa asyadu anna muhammadan abdu wa rasulullah Wa nabi abadda Mabak Good morning ladies and gentlemen The Honorable Dean of Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences Of Universitas Tegri Padang all other faculty deans of Universitas Negeri Padang, vice deans, department heads, keynote speakers, and invited speakers, committee of this conference, and all participants. First of all, allow me in this opportunity to welcome all of this conference participants by first praying our grateful and praise to the Almighty God for Allah, for all his blessing, praise, and mercies that have made us possible together here in this virtual room 
in excellent condition and health. The year keynote speakers, distinguished guests, and participants of the third international conference on chemistry and science education. The mm -hmm. themes of this conference is synthesis in advanced materials and green chemistry for the benefits of future generations. Cutting edge research of chemistry and science education for renewable energy health and sustainable development goals. This event is held by the Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences of Universitas Negripada. We are really sorry to say that our rector cannot be with us due to the other important event that has to attend. So representing the rectors of Universitas Negripada, I'm very pleased to join the opening of this hybrid conference. I wish to convey my sincere appreciation to the head of chemistry department who has regularly held this conference. And this year is the third conference. I would also like to thank all the distinguished speakers for taking time to participate from near and far in today's conference. Professor Halim Kusumat Maja from Durham University, United Kingdom. Professor Lee Yok Heng from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Malaysia. Professor Magiswari Karpu Dewan from University Science Malaysia. Associate Professor Romel Hidayat from Sejong University, South Korea. And Professor Indang Dewata from Universitas Negeri Padang, Indonesia. I believe that this conference will become a good medium and opportunity for us to learn, communicate, and share the current information about the knowledge, concept, theories, and result of the research related to the chemistry and environment. And the most important things are to create networking, to cooperate, collaborate with international researcher and expert, as well as institution in the national international levels. Power of them, through this conference, we can improve the quality of our research, as well as innovation and trends for the global challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, the world today is facing many challenges. We must address the sustainability both in education and science through cooperation with the, within the profession and also with natural and social scientists and the public in the creation of and the application of knowledge for enhancing nation productivity and competitiveness. Curriculum and pedagogical reform in science education especially in chemistry education and chemistry as well, and continuous professional development to encompass wider social and ethical concerns which are very needed. The future challenge for Universitas Negeri Padang is to become an excellent and dignified university in the world and part of a world-class university. So the third ICCHSE is in line with the future development of Universitas Negeri As we expect that the research result and innovations of the faculty members in Universitas Negeri are disseminated to the global community through this conference. Through this conference also, I hope that the lecturers of chemistry department and also from other departments in the faculties of mathematics and natural sciences will be able to get benefits from the collaboration with the world-class professor to make UNP vision come true. That is to become a world-class university. This year conference is also held to celebrate the 68th anniversaries of UNP. It is part of our concern to contribute to education, 
Science and Technology in Indonesia as well as gender. Hopefully, we can significantly give more contribution to nation development and advancements in the future. Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, representing the academic staff, administrative staff, and students of Universitas Negeri Padang, would like to thank all speakers and participants for your contribution, which will make this conference a success. Who could have imagined a better exchange than seeing invited speakers from several countries here joining forces in the conference to share experiences, research funding, and inspiring ideas. And then the most important thing is having opportunity to learn many things from other speakers. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we expect we learn new ideas from each other. We can adopt and adapt to further improve our work in the research. I know that there will be many interesting and useful presentations. I believe many good experiences will be shared and good lessons will be learned. Members of the organizing committee have been working very hard. I'd like to thank them for their dedication, time, and effort. I wish also to thank our patrons, partners, individual and organization partners, and volunteers. Without their generosity, we would not be able to create a total environment to support your full participation. Thank you all for your presence and participation. And you are the very important part of the conference success. Please enjoy the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, the third international conference of chemistry and science education 2022 is officially open. Thank you. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the speech by Vice Rector of Academic Affairs for officially open this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the opening ceremony. We are glad that you have a chance to attend till the end. Before continue to the keynote session, we would like to introduce our first moderator today, Associate Professor Bipahul Kair. He received his master's degree from the University of Technology, Netherlands in 2009 and Dr. degree from Kanazawa University, Japan in 2017. And for second moderator, Lecture Monica Primasari. She received her master degree from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia in 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Associate Professor Mipta Lukair. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <coughs> Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala sayidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi washabbihi ajmain. Honorable Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang, Vice Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang, Dean and Vice Dean of Faculty of Natural Sciences Universitas Negeri Padang, Head of Department Chemistry Department of Universitas Negeri Padang and organizing committee for this international conference and especially for our keynote speakers invited speakers and participants who attend this 
uh, annual conference, international conference on science and education held by chemistry department Universitas Negeri Padang. As the moderator, and I would like to introduce all and especially the first keynote speakers for this morning, and he will be Professor Dr. Indang Dewata. His specialization is in environmental chemistry, and his education is in chemistry and environmental chemistry, starting from his BST in Andalas University, master and doctoral degree in Indonesian University. Now he is full professor in in environmental chemistry in Universitas Negeri Padang. And uh, let's us uh, welcome Professor Dr. Indang Dewata. He will be presenting about uh, identification of microplastic in Indonesian water. This is very uh, interesting topic, especially in Indonesia, which is uh, which have problems, especially with uh, plastic and contamination and pollution uh, in the env environment. Uh, please, Professor Indang Dewata, time is yours. Moon. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. For, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much uh, to uh, organizing committee by Pak Diskimeri and then uh, steering committee Pak Rector and Vice Rector and then uh, Head Department and of the participant. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, in this occasion, I would like uh, to say uh, thank to Allah who has given me the time uh, for uh, uh, coming in this uh, seminar and invited by uh, uh, organizing committee. Okay. Uh, wait a moment. Okay, uh, I would like uh, to share. Okay, uh, my topic is uh, identification of microplastic in Indonesian water. Uh, uh, the outline is my uh, my presentation. Uh, first is uh, introduction, and second uh, method, and third result and discussion, and the next is uh, conclusion. Uh, the the topic identification of uh, micro microplastic in Indonesian water. Uh, why we know that uh, city. 2% Indonesia area is sea and water. Uh, with uh, 1.91 kilometers total water reach uh, 31 million kilometers in almost every 40 million years life is uh, live in a coastal area. It means every population in Indonesia uh, live in a coastal area. 
it means the potential of microplastic uh, is bigger than uh, other country. And then the next, water is the uh, in the ocean are very vulnerable to the treat of plastic uh, pollution. We can see the putri uh, 21, uh, 18. And then the plastic in the water uh, can break uh, down to small, smaller plastic. And we, we know that uh, microplastic uh, less than five millimeter or nanoplastic uh, less than uh, one micrometer. And then exploitation carried out by human cause environmental damage. Yeah. The key clue is uh, the environmental damage in the coastal include Padang City, which marked by pile of plastic waste along the coast. Next. Uh, why microplastic? We can see the feature microplastic uh, pathway in organism uh, from the industry and from the other activity. Plastic flow to the water, and and it can be a secondary micro, secondary and primary uh, microplastic, and then in the water. Uh, come to be uh, sediment and in fishes and analia, and it is a problem in our life. How do uh, microplastic in the water? There are three uh, causes. First, uh, photo degradation, photo catalysis, and electrochemis. And, and then plastic will uh, biodegradation in the water. Uh, to be microplastic and then uh, come to be micro microbial and then biodegradation. It is uh, 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 can they make all of activities. We can see the microplastic uh, in water. First, from human activity, industrial activity, plastic uh, to be uh, fragmentasi by UV mechanical, mechanical in the microbial, microbial, and then plastic yes by fishes and fishing activity. And then plastic uh, come into sea, seabird and aquatic life. It is a problem, uh, the next problem by uh, uh, periodic times. It is uh, how impact the plastic. We can see the plastic come from the main activity uh, such as uh, clothes, food, cosmetic, medicine, and many activities, activities used as plastic. And then to be degradation in the water, in the soil, and the wine, to be microplastic and nanoplastic. And can, in Eastern, can be, uh, they make uh, look like uh, ingestion, dermal inhalation. It is a problem in human health. We can see this picture, yeah. uh, how impact the plastic. First, particle toxicity. Second, oxidation stress. Next, inflammation and translocation and cancer. It is the big impact uh, plastic when uh, when uh, abundant of uh, uh, seawater atmosphere. Okay, what type of microplastic? We can see the type uh, microplastic in water. Uh, first, uh, uh, such as a fragment, a second, a pellet, and then next fiber, and then foam, and then a film. It is uh, uh, consists of micro and nano microplastic, and it can uh, the problem in our uh, uh, sea of water in Indonesia right now. Uh, how method this reset? This reset method is a review article and reset. We can see uh, the study location water of eastern Indonesia, such as uh, Liki Island. Tanjung Tiram, Tiralit, Kendari Bay Water, and Pulau Bay. The next 
the water of the Central Indonesian region are Pulau Bay, Kupang Bay, Bonoa Bay, Karangjahe Water, Manado Bay, Brantas River, Water Sulawesi Coast, and West Flat Canal Estuary. Uh, and then, and the West Indonesian water, including Karimun Land, Bengkalis Land, Untung Awa Land, and River Kota Panjang PLTA, Reservoir, I mean, uh, Reservoir Kota Panjang PLTA, Dumai Water, Batu Deep River, Long Strait, and then the last uh, important uh, Sumatera Barat is Bungus Bay, uh, then and Lampung Bay and Jakarta Bay. Okay, we can see what is uh, the result. Leaky line uh, consists of uh, microplastic, 28.3. And then we can see the others. Uh, Pulau Bay, 187.3. And then in the Western Indonesian water, Untung Awa Island, we can see that 1,324 uh, uh, concentration the microplastic in the water. And then how the Bungus? Bungus, uh, we do that uh, research. We can take the sample for preparation. Uh, we can see the flow chart from the sediment drying and then removal of organic matter using uh, peroxida and then the separation of density of microplastic and sediment was carried out by adding saturated NaCl, kemudian extraction, kemudian, uh, and then uh, filtering, and the neck of surfacing with a micro, micro microscope. So, and 19 and 2019 we can get uh, the concentrate of microplast microplastic in the water of uh, Bungus Bay 194.4 particle it is uh, the problem the neck when the plastic not uh, uh, managed by government on by uh, people when uh, uh, stay in 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 Padang City. Okay, we can see that condition in the uh, two and twenty twenty uh, twenty oh and twenty two obtain uh, water Tanjung Oyster and Amo Bay. Of time in is the East Indonesia, and then Central Indonesia, we can see Kupang Bay. Uh, the spirit of dense population of Kupang City and increasing complex activity carried out by the community have result a large number of pollution and garbage scattered in the water, causing pollution in the water, Indonesian water, middle uh, 0 0.175, and then 245.34 particle can be seen uh, 20, uh, 0 and 21. And average micro plastic identified uh, uh, more uh, bigger than 150 particle. It is highest microplastic identification. And then the type, FIBO, the type of microplastic is fiber type in uh, uh, Kupang City. And the uh, and, uh, Jakarta, and the uh, Bungus Bay, uh, we, we can see the concentration of microplastic 194.44. The data obtained from identification microplastic in the Western Central Indonesia was obtained and long thread, where the number of microplastic identi identified was 392. 
zero particle with the type of microplastic fragment. Then the uh, decay clue, the fr microplastic fragment is the type in the uh, central Indonesia. And in the bungus, yeah, also uh, water waste Indonesia, uh, the content of plastic is low, but it is uh, potential the higher in next time. Yeah. When compared to the water of East Central Indonesia, it is high number, so full of follow up is needed for the amount of microplastic in Bungus area in the Western, in, in the Western Indonesia's water. Uh, we can see the type of microplastic. And then uh, we can see what is our conclusion. First, Identification of microplastic in Indonesian territory has been carried out several Indonesian water, both eastern, central, and western region. Second, from the result of identification, the number of microplastic in eastern Indonesian water is 390 particle in Tanjung Oyster water. In central Indonesia water, uh, 245.34 particle in Kopang Bay area. And in the Western area where it identified was many as uh, 1,920 micro particle in the water in of Selat Panjang. With the site of micro particle identified less than uh, 1,000 micro molecule. And those uh, higher um, 4,000 micro uh, meter being identified most west in Western Indonesia. We state the number of microplastic identified was polluted in the water of in West Indonesia. The key clue uh, was polluted in the water of Indonesia by microplastic. First, as with the result of science, plastic was that degrade in micro. Plastic is very dangerous for the environment and the uh, other living thing. Uh, the key clue, microplastic is very dangerous for environment and uh, other living thing. For future research on the handling of microplastic in Indonesia water is very important especially Western Indonesia water, where the identification microplastic content is still high. And the uh, microplastic, uh, we need a regulation from uh, our government, and then uh, our, people, our population uh, must uh, care about how to manage uh, microplastic, something uh, used as uh, 3R. Reduce, recycle, and uh, recovery, and it is important how to make the economy. So, uh, how to plastic uh, can be uh, garbage and economy, economic circular. It is important how to make uh, uh, population aware about the plastic uh, they make in uh, water. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Dr. Indang Dewata, for the interesting topic about microplastic in water and contamination for our environment. Uh, now we go to the question Hello? answer session. Question answer session. For those who have question, please do not hesitate to raise your hand or write in the chat room in the Zoom meeting or for you are the participants in this room, you can also ask directly to our uh, keynote speaker. Please. <clears throat> okay, uh, please, uh, if you have questions, I do not hear, Mr. Pak Indang. 
Uh, can you hear my voice? Pak Indang Dewata. Okay. 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 Is it now clear or not? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So clear. Oh, very good. Okay. Uh, while waiting for the question for, from the audience, let me, as the moderator, ask you uh, some question related with the microplastic topic. And Pak Indang Dewata, I want to share my experience. Well, while we uh, were in Japan, Japan has good uh, plastic garbage management. So they separate between uh, plastic and non-plastic materials so that all the plastic materials can be recycled after that for the purpose of energy, for the purpose of uh, other material uh, derived from plastic, garbage, and so on. Is it also possible? My question is, is, is it also possible to uh, do the same project in Indonesia, especially in Padang? Because we know before that you were the head of uh, Bureau of Environmental in, in the Padang City government. Is it possible for our government to do the same thing? It is recycling the plastic to get energy and also maybe some uh, product derived from plastic. Please, uh, this is my question. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think, yeah, when we ask that, when uh, is it possible? I think, is, is it possible? Why? And our government law, so we call that, uh, we call that uh, economic circular. How economic circular? Plastic can uh, change to be uh, other product. For example, pellet. Pellet can be uh, uh, can make the other uh, product. It is uh, normally high cost, and then uh, we can we can do anything. So the plastic. We can make uh, the uh, fabric in Padang City. It is possible. Why not? Because the concept uh, 3R, yeah, reduce, recycle, and uh, reuse, it is important for, for, for doing. The problem now is how to uh, make, uh, what we call it, uh, uh, how we call it, uh, how the people, how the people awareness about garbage. It is a problem. It is a problem. When the people aware about that uh, garbage, uh, rubbish come from the plastic, I think uh, the economic will be uh, economic uh, uh, circular from plastic can be uh, practiced. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Indang Dewata. Okay, uh, but while waiting for the question from the audience, I think we can continue our question answer session with the moderator, with me. Uh, the second question is about the microplastic itself. Uh, we know that Indonesia is an archipelago. It has many islands with long uh, uh, line of water and, uh, and the land. And it means that uh, the contamination of the sea from the microplastic is very possible. And we want to know about the effect of uh, microplastic in the people, especially the people who eat the fish and the fish contain microplastic. Is, it, uh, is, this, is there any evidence about the a disaster or the problem regarding the health of the population because of this microplastic containing contained in war in the fish. This is my question. Uh, we can look that uh, from the this picture. <clears throat> Uh, activities industry, industrial activity, yeah. Uh, 
to make the worry about it garbage and throw to be to to water in water can be fragment do a uv mechanical uh microbe and all the uh fish bird and then aquatic life it is uh all about that horse how to problem in human the next we can see the impacts it is marine marine organism it is microplastic or nanoplastic by the wind by the sea by the water uh, can uh, come to the human by ingestion by uh, the impact dermal and the inhalation it is the impact to men in plastic per particle toxicity and then inflammation and then cancer such as translocation and exudation stress yeah the this topic uh, can continue to the new research but right now uh, we want to know uh, is it um, microplastic it is problem in the water area and then we need uh, together research by doctor and then by biochemist and then then by uh, analytic and any uh, expert for uh, uh, for to know that uh, condition i think many uh, many uh, article or journal uh talk about that how the uh, inflammation uh correlation with plastic and then toxic toxicity uh, plastic correlation dengan human health many article talk about it it is we can the uh develop the research by next year maybe maybe uh, in UNP and then uh, environmental chemist thank you uh <clears throat> Thank you so much, Professor Indang Dewata. Uh, it was uh, the answer for my question about the impact and effect of uh, microplastic in human body. Now we have one question from the audience from Mr. R. Gunawan. And I would like, I would like to read the question. Uh, is there any solution to reduce the microplastic in Indonesian water? Or maybe we can utilize the microplastic so that uh, that have been polluting the water, perhaps. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gunawan. Um, I think the, 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 the answer is uh, very simple. How that uh, government must be concerned about the plastic impact. So the regulation must be... Uh, higher than uh, the, the, so regulation first is important things and the second is how to enhancement of uh, people awareness about that uh, pollution and the next how to pollution use reuse recycle and reduce uh, so divided uh, plastic and non plastic we can we can say that uh, organic and inorganic uh, garbage it is important and then uh, two solution first is uh, regulation and second uh, is uh, how to enhancement of uh, uh, how to enhancement of uh, population awareness about uh, garbage thank you Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Argunawan and Pak Indang Dewata for the question and answer. And uh, for the audience, I think we still have time. We actually have time until 10 o'clock in this morning. And I think Pak Indang is still able to answer uh, all the questions from us. And I think it is a good time for us to ask him because his experts is in environmental chemistry. And he also has long experience in the government as the government officer uh, related with environmental project in Padang City. 
and now he also he is also uh, doing some projects in the province of West Sumatra, and they are all about uh, environment. So please ask questions. Okay, but uh, uh, Mita, uh, right now I'm on Nado, okay. and uh, uh, if easy finish, uh, I want to go to the uh, the some place on Bunaken. My friend has uh, waiting me. Uh, okay, it's okay. I think it is not. Yeah. Any question? Maybe one person. I think not. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay. Okay. Mm. I think it is enough for Indah. Okay. Uh, okay. No problem because all the question has been answered and we have, uh, even if we have enough, we have still have time. But I think okay. we can finish our session for Pak Indang. And for all the audience, please uh, greet Pak Indang and thanks Pak Indang by <laughs> applause or big applause. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Uh, Pak Mister, I'm sorry. Uh, I leave from this uh, Zoom. Okay, no problem. Uh, and, uh, I, I I want to try uh, to connect again uh, after, after this. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Pak Indang. Uh, have safe journey and enjoyable trip in Manado. Okay, I see. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, now, uh, all the uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have finished our first uh, keynote speaker session, and I think we can continue with the second keynote speaker. Uh, even if it should be start, it should start at 10 o'clock in the morning. I think it is possible because we have time, and we can continue with our next presenter our next keynote speaker and we call professor Lee Yong Lee Yu Heng from Malaysia uh, professor Lee Yu Heng uh, are you available yes i'm here is it possible thank you chairman yes is it possible for you to give your speech at this time uh, yes right i'm ready yeah okay okay thanks so much Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, read his curriculum vitae. He is Professor Dr. Li Yu Heng. He is Honorable Professor in Bioanalytical Chemistry, Department of Sci Chemical Science, Faculty of Science and Technology, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, UKM, Malaysia. His field of, his, of research is Analytical and Bioanalytical Chemistry with specialization in Biosensor and Chemical Sensor. His qualification is PhD from Institute of Biotechnology, Cambridge University, England. And he has long experience in research, about 35 years. And he also has experience as fellow of uh, Royal Society of Chemistry, RSC, England, and fellow of Malaysian Institute of Chemistry, M FMIC. And he has publication about 300 in index journal. So this is our keynote speaker, and he will be talking about uh, versatile acrylic materials for biosensor membranes. Professor Li Yu Heng, time is yours. You have around 45 minutes to give your presentation, and we will have 15 minutes for question and answer. Time is yours, Professor Li. Okay, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, salam sejahtera, and selamat pagi. Uh, kepada semua uh, peserta yang saya hormati, uh, I'm very honored to be invited uh, to give this talk for such a well attended uh, conference. And uh, and what I'm going to talk about today is a uh, on the acrylic material that have been used for biosensor membranes. Uh, this is a conference that uh, where uh, it's quite a, what I say is quite a multidisciplinary, uh, perhaps uh, not many people know about biosensor technology. Uh, although we don't hear much about biosensor, but we have been using biosensor for quite a while. For example, your glucose test kit, uh, the pregnancy test kit, and also the recently during the pandemic, 
we have the COVID test kit. These are all biosensor devices. So without us knowing what is biosensor, we actually have been using them for a long time already. So uh, the objective of the talk uh, like I shown here, basically I want to introduce uh, a bit more on biosensor, uh, uh, knowing that not that many of us, uh, actually even those in analytic chemistry area, also not probably not so familiar with this. I will also introduce a bit of the acrylic polymer and how it is used in the biosensor uh, technology area. And uh, for the acrylic material, I will focus on two area. One is what we call the two-dimensional frame uh, that used in a biosensor. I make it as 2D membrane. Another one is a three-dimensional uh, material. Uh, mostly these are little, little spheres uh, called nanosphere. So because they are 3D, uh, three-dimension uh, compared to a, a frame, so I call it 3D membrane. So my focus on the biosensor example will be on both of these. Uh, another important aspect of biosensor is the use of the uh, biomolecules, for example, enzyme and DNA and also whole cell. So in this talk, I will also show you how all these uh, bioreceptor can be used uh, with the biosensor to achieve uh, many applications. Uh, for this talk, I will focus on the analysis of food, especially uh, formaldehyde and nitrite, which are the uh, considered toxic substance in our food, and also genetic modified uh, food, GM food, food that have been genetically modified uh, that also need to be labeled. So for those who are not so familiar with the biosensor technology, basically uh, the biosensor consists of a uh, recognition element. This is uh, either a chemical or bioreceptor that can detect the analyte by chemically uh, interact with the analyte. All right. So uh, after that, the chemical uh, and physical signal generated during the interaction, sometimes can be a current, sometimes can be a change in potential, uh, sometimes it can be light given off, like fluorescence, and sometimes also color change. So all this signal will be given out, and we can capture this signal by using some kind of transducer. The transducer can be an electrochemical or conductivity device, uh, or optical device like spectrophotometer or photometer or refractometer. Uh, sometimes we can measure the change in the uh, mass of PSO electric uh, device. So after we get all this signal, the signal itself will be processed into some kind of a number that we can read, okay, especially concentration that we need to know. So this will go to a, a, a series of electronics in the device. So this, this is uh, what is happening, uh, how a sensor works. So you have the analyte uh, coming in, only the target will fit into the recognition layer, all right, the bioreceptor. And then the signal will transduce, okay, transduce, and then uh, we will capture this signal through the transducer. So these are the components of a, a biosensor, uh, like I mentioned just now. Uh, you have the analyte of the sample here. You have the bioreceptor on the surface, uh, sometimes inside the, the, the cell, the membrane also. So uh, this will capture whatever uh, analyte on the surface. And uh, this bioreceptor, like I say, it can be some kind of enzymes, it can be uh, uh, antibody, it can be DNA, or sometimes it can be a, a, a whole living cell uh, to, 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 to be specific to certain analyte. So the signal uh, generated will go to the transducer, which is, can be electrochemical, uh, the common analytical method used will be potentiometry, amperometry, uh, optical, absorption, fluorescence, and reflection, and also piezo electric. So the signal generated out by the transducer will be amplified and then uh, a process to give us some, some kind of reading. So the type of biosensor actually will be uh, uh, depends on what, what, what sort of biomaterial you use. Example, you can use enzyme, uh, you can use enzyme. Then uh, the common one we have been using, uh, bar sensor have been using, you can buy from the market, is a glucose test kit for diabetic people. Uh, antibody antigen also we, you can use uh, in a biosensor concept. Uh, this is typically the pregnancy test kit uh, the, and the COVID test kit that have been used extensively now during a pandemic. 
So the test kit they use at COVID actually is a bar sensor that based on antibody and antigen reaction. Uh, we can also use DNA and lately aptamer, uh, a kind of DNA uh, is also common, common use now. But commercial device based on DNA is still not so available as yet. It's still in the process of developing. Whole cell biosensor, we actually can use a, a living cell as a, as a bioreceptor to detect some, uh, some, some chemicals. So uh, today I will show you uh, some of this, uh, especially the uh, enzyme base, uh, the DNA base, and also the whole cell base uh, biosensor. So at the end of the day, what we want to see is uh, a big equipment in the lab have been turned into a small handheld device. Okay, just like your test kit, glucose test kit or COVID test kit that we, you can do the analysis anywhere you like, uh, and and anybody can do it. You do need to have a trained analytical chemist. You do need to have a lab to do that. So that is the aim of uh, uh, producing a biosensor. So then what are the advantages of the biosensor uh, for analysis? First, decentralization of laboratory analysis. So uh, you, you no longer need to send all your sample to the laboratory for chemical analysis. Maybe you can do it on site, even you can do it at, at home. Replacement of costly hardware, uh, big equipment are no longer needed. Uh, you have also all the uh, small, small uh, 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 device that you can uh, handheld and portable. Sometimes you can use on con uh, online and real-time analysis because it is so portable. You can do it anytime, anywhere. A uh, replacement of existing bioassay. Uh, bioassay generally are complicated and then although it, it is uh, much simplified, but it's still uh, very much lab-based. So uh, it can it will actually replace existing bioassay. Uh, of course, it will be a sensor. You can actually do remote sensing, okay? Especially at, at worst environment, environment that human cannot reach, then you can put a sensor there to detect the changes. High throughput uh, biology, because, because the sensor can uh, respond very fast, you can uh, get a lot of data uh, in a short time. And finally, the, the most concern is the personalized me medicine. So in the future, we can actually test ourselves. Uh, some example, uh, we can now do COVID test on ourselves. No need to go to the hospital. Google test for diabetic patient and pregnancy test kit for, for people who want to know whether they have been, uh, for lady who, who want to know whether they have been pregnant or not. So these are all uh, biosensors that are available in the pharmacy that you can buy now and then they are all commercialized. So like I say, biosensor is not something that uh, uh, nobody uh, 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 knows. You actually have been used it without knowing about it. So now uh, that's biosensor. I hope you roughly know, uh, have an idea of how, how it is uh, used uh, for your benefit. And, and now I will move into more technical part of biosensor, how we construct a biosensor. The first thing, uh, you will have a membrane that I mentioned just now. You must have a membrane here to hold the bioreceptors. Okay, this is a sensor membrane or sensor frame to hold the bioreceptor. And uh, in our case, we have been exploring uh, using acrylic type of membrane. Acrylic uh, is also very well known. Uh, we have been using a lot of acrylic because uh, they use a coating. They have a uh, very uh, resistant uh, to damage. Uh, they are good transparency, just like glass. Uh, so we have been using that a long time already, uh, but not as in biosensor, but as some kind of uh, household uh, uh, stuff. So to to produce uh, acrylic polymer, we need we need acrylic monomer. So uh, you put some initiator, uh, you give them some heat or light, you will form the polymer. So this double bond will polymerize itself to give a long change of what we call acrylic polymer. Acrylic polymer is also a common ingredient in latex paint. So uh, our paint that, uh, uh, that used to paint the wall and so on, uh, or, or, or our color, basically, they are also made of acrylic polymers. And acrylic polymers is also uh, good for protection of the surface. It's water resistant, uh, very good adhesion, acrylic type, very good adhesion. So it is very important for sensor application. Resistant to cracking and blistering because they are quite elastic. Uh, resistant to alkali, glancer, uh, and also extremely waterproof, weatherproof. So uh, outdoor is also good. That's why it's very good to use at latex paint uh, for painting our house. Uh, it's a 
the 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 most of the thing that we know about acrylic uh, uh polymer, but uh for biosensor application we need to know more about the characteristic. So uh these sort of polymer are very versatile because uh first thing, the monomer contains a lot of uh functional group, for example hydroxyl group, amine group, which make it very hydrophilic and or it can make a hydrogel, okay, or it can only be active group like uh. Uh, which can react with some other things uh, for immobilization purpose or it can be very hydrophobic contains the hydrocarbon change so the polymer can be hydrophobic and uh, it can contain the monomer can contain the r group here can contain the uh, very polar group like for foreign so you have a polar property of the polymer and it can be cross-linked also if you have another a double bond here the polymer can cross link to give you a very elastic uh, polymer. But uh, for most important thing for bar sensor is the ability to contain a uh, succinimide group here. The succinimide group can use to bind all the biomolecule or bioreceptor of the biosensor during the uh, immobilization process. So one of the uh, very interesting thing about this polymer is able to photo cure. Photo cure means all we need to do is uh, put a drop of the polymer uh, monomer here, we shine a light, and then we'll get a layer of film. So this is a two dimension film that uh, can be a biosensor sensing layer. It's very easy to, to work with as long as you have a, 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 a right power UV light. So by doing that, we actually can develop a uh, deposit quite a different layer of the film on the surface, for example, uh, enzyme layer, uh, uh, conducting layer and so on to make an electrode in this case is to make an electrode uh, for the uh, sensor device so uh, based on this concept actually uh, we have developed in the 1990s at Cambridge University we have developed a, a quite a large uh, uh, amount of uh, what we call the ion sensor membranes so in the ion sensor this is uh, we use potentiometry, okay? Potentiometry, where we're detecting potential changes at the surface. So we need to put or immobilize a ionophore that capture the, for example, even to detect pH, uh, the ionophore can capture the hydrogen ion, all right, to form a complex. So it will create a potential change at the surface, then we detect the potential change. So uh, this, the blue color, is actually is the acrylic membrane. So uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the early stage of the sensor development of for ION, we are able to develop plasticizer free film by combining different monomers. Uh, the plasticizer free is very important because uh, in the past, uh, PVC with plasticizer have been used a lot uh, for this sort of, uh, ion selective membrane. But the plasticizer tend to leach up and the membrane become uh, uh, not responsive. So we, we replace the plasticizer with a low TG uh, membrane. So there's no longer need plasticizer. Very good adhesion. Uh, we can do take firm uh, solid state uh, ion sensor. So uh, at that time, uh, we have developed a lot of uh, sensor, uh, including potassium, sodium, calcium, ammonium, and pH. So uh, this is uh, how we managed to produce the uh, plasticizer free mem 2D membrane, okay, the 2D frame. So by using uh, Amputide acrylic, which is uh, quite hydrophobic, plus a, a hydrophobic cross linker. Right? You can also use meta, meta acrylic and amputide acrylic, but this is a much better. Okay? This, this combination is much better, give you a more uh, uh, what you call hydrophobic firm for ion sensing. Uh, we can also adjust the what we call the uh, hydrophobic city or hydrophilic city of the frame by introducing uh, the a hydroxyl a group in the polymer uh, with metacrylic or, or butyl acrylate. So uh, here show that the diffusion coefficient of, of the ferrocene uh, tend to be uh, a lower if you immobilize it okay, in the uh, frame. If not, the end trap diffusion is much faster. So this proves that the polymer actually can change the, the behavior of things that diffuse inside. And uh, also for the ion sensor, uh, if you want to immobilize the ionophore, the ionophore actually is the substance that capture the, the ion itself. 
in this case, uh, benzoyl 18 cloud 6 will capture potassium. So if you can attach it to the polymer, this will not leak up from the membrane also. So again, this can use UV photo cure by introducing a uh, acrylic group here. You can actually, uh, the receptor can be immobilized onto the membrane. So this will create uh, 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 an electrode that's nothing to leach out from the membrane and uh, more stable and long lasting. So we can also adjust the, the polymer hydrophilicity to incorporate enzyme, okay? So enzyme need a more hydrophilic environment, not like the iron four, which need a hydrophobic environment. So this need a hydrophilic, we use a lot of HEMA, okay? HEMA and uh, butyl acrylic to create a, a hydrophilic environment to allow the enzyme to, to uh, stay inside to create a biosensor. All right, so it's, it's so much about the uh, early development of the uh, acrylic polymer for ion sensing. But lately, we have been, uh, uh, again, using the two, 2D membrane structure, we have de developed different type of uh, biosensor. Uh, one is for formaldehyde analysis based on enzyme, based on attachment of enzyme on the electrode or on the sensor surface. So why is formaldehyde important? Because uh, 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 most of the seafood product is, uh, is either preserved in formaldehyde or the food itself, the fish itself or the prawn itself generate formaldehyde uh, naturally. So this uh, can be uh, toxic to human uh, or can create a, a cancerous uh, a problem. So uh, therefore there's always a need to uh, uh, detect formaldehyde in our seafood, uh, especially the, 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 the food uh, the fish and prawn and at the moment the the, the method used will be hplc uh chromatography or if the amount is high we can use actually a uh, spectrophotometric method and these are all lab method so uh, if you can develop uh, a test kit just like uh, for formula high it will be very useful that's what we're trying to do and uh, this is one that we developed uh, uh, quite recently, 2022, just published this one, uh, is to use, uh, is to put uh, in the polymer a, a dye called nine blue comma ionophore, which can bind to the hydrogen ion, pH. Okay, so when the pH changes, this layer will change according to this spectrum here. So uh, when uh, the protonation, when the proton is come out, the color become a red. So when the proton attached to the surface, it become blue. So, and what we want to do is that we will use an enzyme called alcohol oxidase. Alcohol oxidase will, will react, uh, will catalyze the uh, oxidation of formaldehyde to uh, formic acid. Formic acid is an acid, so it will change the color of the membrane. So more formaldehyde, it will change more to blue color, okay? So in this membrane, we use uh, the, the metacrylate and butyacrylate copolymer. This, this membrane need to be quite uh, hydrophobic, okay? And uh, the surface, how do we put the enzyme? In this case, we trap it in, in another type of uh, polymer called so gel, okay? So gel uh, membrane to, to prevent the enzyme alcohol oxidase from escaping. So this is the changes with the concentration of the formaldehyde. As you can see, uh, you can get a linear relationship right? and uh, you can detect down to 10 to minus 6 millimolar, uh, which is very low and good enough for detecting formaldehyde contamination. And uh, we also have tried different types of fish, uh, uh, fish that have been uh, kept for some time. All right. And also we compare to the NASH standard method. This is a spectrophotometry method. You'll notice that they are quite comparable, the result. They show that the test kit or the biosensor is actually is useful at, at its com uh, even though it, it is portable and a small uh, color change device. Uh, another way to detect formaldehyde uh, is to what we call to use a potentiometric biosensor. All right. So this also based on the, the same concept, but uh, we measure potential change. Again, here we put a ion selective uh, ionophore that send pH, H plus on the surface. But now the enzyme, we can attach to succinic in mind. The enzyme no longer trapped in the polymer, but it just attached on the surface through the succinic bond I showed you early. So when the uh, enzyme catalyzes oxidation of the uh, formaldehyde to the formic acid, you will get a change in the potential. 
So this is a polymer. Uh, this is the uh, succinimide group that attached to the enzyme. You can see that uh, as uh, the the sensitivity of the bar sensor is basically uh, depend on the uh, the monomer, the the uh, succinimide monomer. So uh, when you have more most of this monomer, then uh, you have more enzyme attached. You get a better sensitivity. So uh, this is the response. Uh, the the limit, uh, limit detection is 0 0.1 millimolar. So it's a very large range of formaldehyde you can detect using uh, this this uh, potential metric for multi-high sensor. And you can see that the uh, it's sensitive to formaldehyde, maybe a bit on acid aldehyde, but other substance is it won't detect at all. So it has a relatively good uh, selectivity towards formaldehyde. So uh, this is for the formaldehyde. Uh, I'll show you another biosensor using nitrite. Okay, we are now talking about two D membrane. All right, nitrite. Why we detect nitrite? Uh, a country that produce bird nest, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, maybe Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, we are producing a lot of bird nests, uh, and then most of these are export to China. Okay, so the problem with bird nest is that uh, uh, it's naturally occur a lot of nitrite. Okay, due to nitrification of the uh. Uh, bird nest environment so uh, the dropping also can cause a lot of nitrite this is toxic so uh, there's a need to detect nitrite okay so uh, to detect nitrite uh, again we're using the, the film okay the, the poly acrylic film uh, uh, we're using succinate in mind now we use a bio uh, a protein uh, called hemoglobin hemoglobin is from it, it can get from our blood so you can attach hemoglobin on the surface hemoglobin will catalyze the uh, conversion of the uh, nitrite to uh, to NO, all right? So during the process, uh, uh, the oxidation reduction process, current will produce, and we use uh, the transducer, uh, what we call differential pulse voltammetry. So we measure the current that produced when this reaction happened at the surface. So again, we're using this polymer, we attach the uh, uh, we attach the hemoglobin here, somewhere here, all right, and then we let it react with the uh, nitrite, and we also add some graphene, uh, gram graphene to to allow the conductivity so that the current can go through the the, the membrane, all right. So this is a response. You can say that uh, uh, this is the DPV, the current, the arrows, the current, okay, changes with concentration, and then you get a linear con a relation ship also all right so uh, you can detect down to 0 0.03 milligram per liter of nitrite and it's a, it show very good selectivity it's not affected by most of the ion okay especially at low concentration and then uh, it can be compared to the grease method for the analysis of nitrite so this proves that the the bar sensor actually is as useful as the grease method that we use in the lab for nitrite analysis so another uh, possible usage of this uh, uh, biosensor is uh, to use it, acrylic, a 2D acrylic membrane is to develop DNA biosensor for genetic modified food, okay? Uh, why do we need to detect DNA? So uh, you know that a lot of disease uh, caused by pathogen, pathogen are virus, bacteria, and so on. Uh, so uh, detecting this disease is important in our food to prevent uh, 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 infectious uh, uh, problem. Another uh, uh, for food contamination is uh, apart from bacteria and fungus, we got HALA food also. HALA uh, detection of bosai in our food, uh, very important for Muslim. And also genetic modified food, uh, it also consider sometimes uh, people are not sure about it, the safety. So there's a regulation to need to uh, identify how much of the food have been genetic modified. So this, what we do is to detect the DNA. The DNA. Again, DNA, uh, we can detect uh, pollution by pathogen in water and air also. Okay, so the DNA detection actually is quite important. So for the soya bean, uh, for the DNA biosensor, we use soya bean. Because soya bean has been uh, quite extensively genetic modified. Most of the soya bean probably is already genetic modified. So when they modify, they'll contain this DNA inside the uh, uh, genetic modified soya bean, all right? So we we'll use this as a probe to detect whether the food has contained the, the genetic modified component. 
So to do that, again, we'll use the same membrane, uh, which we attach a DNA on top, okay, through the uh, sulfate amide group, uh, attach a DNA uh, probe. So that, that uh, and then we let it hybridize, let the sample, the target DNA hybridize. When hybridized, the surface is uh, full of the DNA, the indicator, which is called AQMS, uh, uh, Rickdorf species, will not be able to enter. So the current will be very low at the surface. But if it's not hybridized, that means there's no GM uh, DNA there. The surface is empty. This uh, uh, Rickdorf active compound can reach the surface, it will give a high current. So the change in current, will, uh, the decrease in current will tell us whether the substance can contain the, the GM DNA or not. So as you can see from here, all right, uh, like I explained just now, it blocked accessibility, then we know that there's a, a, a GM DNA there. And uh, for example, C has the lowest current because uh, hybridization occur. The rest current is high because no hybridization. And it is depend on uh, how long is the DNA, okay, the, 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 the black. Uh, if non complementary uh, you can see that uh, when they don't hybridize, the signal is very low, okay. When they hybridize, the signal is very high, okay, the change in current. And then this is the uh, linear range. It can detect down to very low concentration of DNA or low concentration of the uh, GM DNA, like 10 to the minus 16. And uh, we can actually compare with the standard PCR method. So just like COVID test kit, sometimes we, we do the PCR analysis because this is a standard. So compare the PCR and the, uh, the biosensor uh, for the GM DNA. You can see that they actually they are almost a matching okay or open matching this show that even the test kit like the dn dna bar sensor can be used uh, uh, to identify a gm uh, food so now we are talking about the the 2d membrane so what 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 is about 3d membrane so the acrylic uh acrylic substance allow us to uh, develop a 3d membrane as well 3d means uh uh, we develop the the membrane containing particle which is of nano and microsphere size. Okay, so to do this, it is not that difficult. We put all the uh, monomer, including the succinct imide monomer, and then we do UV radiation on the surface. Okay, sonication UV radiation on the surface. So we have produced a lot of these little particles. Uh, the particles was then uh immobilized with the uh. Uh, bioreceptor, this can be coated onto the surface of the sensor. Okay, so it can be electrode, it can be optical device. So if we put, put under the SEM, electron micrograph, you can see that the particles are of different sizes, but generally they are 0.5 micron to 2 micron in size. Okay, there's a lot of them, just like a powder like that. Uh, these particles are very sticky, so they can stick well onto the electrode surface. Then you can start to immobilize all your enzyme dna or whole cell onto the surface then you put onto the electric surface or you can put onto a, a, a optical device so you have a, what we call the 3d membrane 3d because now you have three dimension it's not just top and bottom uh, the whole surface actually can use to react with the analyte it's a three dimension surface so let's Look at again, how can we make a formaldehyde uh, biosensor using this 3D acrylic microsphere? We can do the same using the alcohol oxidase. So we immobilize it on the surface and then we put on put it on the electrode. So you see that uh, actually we can do that also. The amount of sphere that we use, the larger actually will give you the more the more better response. So the sphere actually is controlling, can control the sensitivity of the of the sensor. So here you can see that there's a response of the uh, 3D membrane uh, to formaldehyde. Uh, if you do have formaldehyde, there's no response. Uh, but uh, if you just trap the uh, the uh, enzyme onto the polyhema, basically very poor response. All right. So you can see from if we compare, uh, if you trap, actually no good, you know. Uh, if you trap, if you don't trap, you use a sphere, you can get the response uh, very fast. 
uh, only 11 seconds, you get the response. If you use a polyhema membrane, a 2D membrane, you take a long time, you know, because things need to diffuse through the membrane. This one, it will diffuse through the pores in the sphere, okay? And also the immobilized one is a uh, very long lasting, very stable, long lasting up to 50 days for the sensor performance. But if you just trap it uh, without immobilization using a, a 2D membrane, it lasts only about 10 days, okay? The sensor will be uh, uh, degraded. So again, you can see the selectivity is very good. Uh, methanol, ethanol, glucose uh, do not interfere at all, very little interfere. All right, so uh, just now we talked about the formaldehyde. Now let's look, go back at the nitride again using 3D uh, uh, acrylic membrane. So in this case, we use what you call a whole cell, a living cell. We can, can we use a living cell to do biosensor? Yes, we can. So in this case, we are using a living cell, uh, Platycola bacterium. It's a bacterial cell, okay? Bacterium, the bacteria also can be attached on the surface to the succinimide group. And then we have fear that contains the nine blue ionophore uh, sensitive to pH. So uh, at alkaline, it is pink color, okay? At acidic, this is blue color. So when the, uh, when the bacteria uh, react with the nitrite, okay, with the nitrite, uh, so if you nitrite, it will produce the uh, ammonium hydroxide. And at the same time, the, uh, the, the cofactor will be oxidized and reduced, okay? So uh, oxidized and reduced, you, you need to have this NADPH, the uh, cofactor, to, to activate the, the reaction of the, of the enzyme, okay? The biochemical reaction. So we also immobilize this onto the surface of the uh, sphere. So we immobilize two things. Three things actually. First, the common ionophore immobilized in the sphere. At the surface, we immobilize the uh, bacteria, and then we also immobilize the NAD cofactor so that the biochemical reaction can happen at the surface, produce hydroxide. The hydroxide will change the blue color to pink color. All right. So that's what you get. And uh, what we do now is that we measure the refractance. Refractance. We don't measure color. We measure refractance. So. Uh, when there is a uh, nitrite, the refractance will, will go down. Okay, so you can see from here, the very dark color, blue color, no nitrite. As get more and more nitrite, uh, the color getting lighter and lighter. So uh, the refractance value is higher. So this you can see from here, this is a calibration curve. So in this case, we can also develop an optical based uh, biosensor using whole cell for the uh, uh, nitrite. Uh, this shows this, the the reference uh, the the interference, but actually even nitrate also not interfering. Most of the uh, thing that present in the sample are not interfering. So this is a very specific uh, optical sensor or uh, optical test kit. All right. So finally, uh, we will look at the final one is the uh, uh, 3D acrylate membrane for DNA biosensor. Just I show you using a 2D membrane, but we can do 3D also. 3D. What we do is that. First, we put some gold nanoparticle on the electrode, which contains the, uh, 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 then we put the sphere, okay, this uh, 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 microsphere. The gold nanoparticle is to, is to increase the conductivity of the membrane, okay, the 3D membrane. So then we attach a probe, the probe of the uh, uh, GM, uh, GM, the DNA, okay, and then we let it hybridize. You hybridize, it will capture this, uh, what we call the uh, Rigdox uh, mediator. It will capture during hybridization, and then we run the electrochemistry of this uh, AQMS, okay, this Rigdox mediator. So we'll get a signal. So this is published in 2014. Uh, this, this is the work done by uh, Dr. Arisa, I think he's in, uh, in this uh, University of uh, uh, Nagara Padang. Okay, so Right, so this is the, the response. You can see more uh, nanosphere on the surface, give you a better response. So indicate uh, more binding of DNA, uh, more sensitive. And uh, again, you can see it has a very large range, 10 to minus 15 to 10 minus 18 molar of DNA you can detect, uh, very low detection limit, down to 10 to minus 16, all right? So uh, conclusions, uh, I'm finished off now. The uh, 
the acrylic base port material, although it has been very, very old material, it's nothing new of this material, I've been using it uh, in, uh, uh, in our daily life, but it has not been explored that much for biosensor, all right? It's only quite recent that we develop it for use of biosensor. Is it good because uh, we can make a two-dimensional film or 2D membrane, uh, just a layer, you know, or we can make the sphere and coat it on the surface uh, like a three-dimension film, and then we can attach the biomolecule, example, enzyme, living cell, or DNA, and so on, on the surface uh, to detect a specific substance. And, uh, we, and we found that the acrylic, of, uh, the, the 3D membrane contained the acrylic, nano, or microsphere, uh, actually uh, could improve the sensor response compared to the, the, the 2D type. Okay? This is because uh, we can get a better linear response range, uh, larger response range because of the uh, uh, higher uh, loading of the uh, receptor, ion, uh, receptor uh, biomolecule, and also faster response because allow diffusion of uh, analyte in and out of the uh, uh, surrounding sphere. So uh, achieve a 2D membrane, okay, can be achieved with a 3D membrane. So, uh, so definitely there's a lot we can do with this uh, in the future using this sort of material. And old material, but we found new applications, new novel applications. Finally, I would like to thank uh, the ICCHSE uh, committee for inviting me to, to give this talk, and also uh, uh, Dr. Arisa as well uh, for his encouragement to, to give the talk. Uh, I'm very happy to, 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 to talk to all of you, and, uh, and uh, if you have any question, uh, please uh, uh, forward to me. Thank you very much. So, uh, Chairman, So uh, back to you, Chair, Mr. Chairman. Ada problem teknikal kayaknya, Prof. Lee. Uh, yeah? Kena tunggu sekejap. Ada problem. Okay, okay. Uh, mungkin lambat lah. Eh? Okay. Yeah, okay, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Okay ke tadi? <laughs> okay, Prof. Lagi bagus. Okay, okay, okay. Sebab so, saya uh, tak tahu apa-apa on this yeah, side. Saya, <laughs> saya semak selalu dari awal sampai akhir waktu itu saja. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, yeah. Prof. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Lee, for your uh, presentation. And it is very nice presentation, actually, about biosensor. And yeah. now we have in our chat room in Zoom, we have two questions. Two questions. And the first question is, can biosensor detect ammonia and its concentration in human blood. And the second question is, what is uh, detected by glucose biosensor? Is it the glucose or the enzyme? Which part of the body is, is it taken from? From the blood cell or liver? Thanks. Okay. okay uh, please. Yeah, yeah, the first question, uh, what was it? Okay, can you, uh, you, if you don't mind, repeat? The first question. Yeah. Okay. Can biosensor detect ammonia and its concentration in human blood? Uh, detect ammonia in human blood? Uh, yeah, of, of course, I think it, it can. Uh, many of the uh, blood chemistry uh, uh, have been tested using testing strip. I think this is quite well established also. For example, potassium uh, and so on. Uh, or glucose, a uh, raw test strip. This test strip actually is biosensor based. I believe ammonia uh, can be, uh, they should be available by now, but it's not, is it, is it that often to detect ammonia in blood uh, or ammonium? Maybe uh, in, uh, in urine, yeah. Okay, the second question, what was it? 
And the second question is, what is detected by the glucose biosensor? Is it the glucose or the enzyme? And which part of the body is taken is it taken from from the blood cell or liver? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for detecting of glucose, uh, normally uh, for blood chemistry, we, we take whole blood, you know, whole blood. So uh, what actually detecting is a glucose, but the glucose will react with the enzyme, the glucose oxidase that have been uh, immobilized onto the, the test strip. So if you use a, a, a glucose meter, you're given a test strip, okay? Then you uh, pick your finger, a bit of blood come out, then you smear it onto the, the test strip, and then you wait for a while. you press the uh the reader you wait for a while and then you'll get some reading uh how many milligram per millimole of uh glucose so basically you use the uh it's more suitable for, for whole blood okay because the sensor itself is designed for whole blood if you use other like urine uh maybe it's not so good because pH is different okay okay i think yes uh thank you so much Hi, right. uh, and we go to the next question. Uh, thank good morning in this forum, uh, Sita Harris. And good morning, Professor Dr. Lee Yo Heng. Thanks yes. for your nice presentation. I would like to ask some question. Is it possible to make biosensor for food halal food test? And what kind of bioreceptor that we can use? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there's been a lot of attempt to make a, 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 a sensor or test kit for Hala. Uh, uh, very of I think some of the so so called commercial available uh, test kit for Hala is uh, based on I think immuno antibody. So, uh, but I think the better better uh test kit should based on DNA. Okay. Uh, a pig DNA, and uh, it it has been uh, a few has been published, but uh, commercially available still not yet. So all we need to do is to select the uh, DNA that is uh, specific to the uh, the porcine content. Then uh, we we can uh, do the bar sensor as I show you just now. Uh, that can detect the DNA, uh, whether the the porcine DNA in the food. So that you can tell whether the food is halal or not. Is it possible to do that? It has been done also, but it's not commercially available, I think. Okay, but I think it is expensive, right? <laughs> uh, not quite expensive, I think. Uh, power sensor basically, uh, they are small device and it's disposable. So uh, the, the, the amount of uh, chemical, uh, the top things we use to develop the DNA actually minute. So overall, the sensor is probably doesn't cost that much. Uh, it's affordable. Okay, thanks so much. And we still have one question. Uh, how many ways to choose bio recognition elements? Can we do some computational method in the beginning to make sure that we are able to see the percentage chance of the NI that can be detected? How many, how many ways to choose what? Okay. Professor. Computation, you mean? Uh, yeah, can we do maybe uh, some computational method to predict or to see the percentage chance about the analyte concentration maybe? Or yeah, the... uh, what, what I understand is that uh, it's simulation. What sim can we simulate? Uh, uh, Yes, uh, it's possible. If you are uh, uh, designing an aptomer, aptomer is basically artificial form of DNA. We actually will do simulation, do what we call the uh, computational design. So to 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 design a a, a DNA based uh, biomolecule we call aptomer uh, to be specific to that uh, and the like. It can be a bacteria. It can be a protein. You know. Uh, even COVID protein also people have been doing aptomer to develop that so that uh, it can be specific to the uh, virus itself. So it's possible to use this sort of uh, uh, computational device, uh, computational method, especially for uh, simulation and you know and see how the structure look like and how it how it react with the uh, uh, virus or the bacteria. So at the moment, uh, aptomer seem to be the, the best 
and it's a bit of a, a, a development now. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think uh, this is the question from the audience in the chat room. And from myself, I want to I want also to ask you about uh, yes. your sensor about uh, electrochemical DNA based sensor for GMO from craft yes. leak to the membrane. And this time you use reset, uh, reduced graphene oxide. Yes. Uh, is it possible to use other uh, carbon based material? For example, we have activated carbon maybe or graphite only to instead of reset uh, reduced graphene oxide (RGO). Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, there are a lot of carbon material you can use, like uh, carbon nanotube, but uh, recently a lot of carbon dots also. Uh, the, the most important thing is uh, uh, what is the conductivity? So the function of the radiographic oxide here is to improve the conductivity. Uh, not all carbon bacteria uh, can provide uh, as good a conductivity as uh, graphene. Uh, carbon nanotube might be okay. But if just use normal carbon, carbon uh, probably is not that useful. So uh, before this, we tend to use a uh, gold nanoparticle. But uh, we found that uh, uh, a graphene give a better better re response okay. because this is, uh, solely they are involved in the conductivity, the electron transfer. So when the uh, when the the indicator, red dot indicator is oxidized or reduced during the biochemical reaction. Uh, something need to transfer the electron to the electrode okay because in the acrylic polymer uh, electrons are hard to transfer it's not so conducting so that's why we enhance the conductivity of the membrane uh, use uh, graphene you can use uh, other material uh, maybe i think a carbon nanotube will be good but uh, carbon that not so conducting uh, probably uh, is not that useful okay Okay, so it is a matter of the conductivity. Yes, yes, conductivity. Okay, I think uh, we there is no question, no more question, and I think we have finished our uh, the end of this session for Professor Lee, and we would like to thank him uh, for his nice presentation, and it's really very interesting because about biosensor we can detect almost every chemical, for example, simple iron poly iron polycations and also biomolecule can be detected by the basis so it is very interesting and we also would like to thank professor lee for the collaboration with our department especially dr alizar yeah. <laughs> uh, so we we are happy with this okay uh, for the audience that's us thanks and greet professor lee with a warm applause <laughs> thank you thank you okay. thanks so much professor lee and I think we will go to the next keynote speaker, but uh, I will hand in this session to the master of ceremony because the next moderator will be Mrs. Monique. Okay, thank you so much for your attention and I will leave this uh, room. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Before starting the next session, let's enjoy for a moment the appearance of the video profile.
Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. A business center and a teacher education center. We are studying the different properties at UNP and we are very proud to be an Indonesian experience here at UNP. We love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD, Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama saya Maria Adeline Doroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. Mabuhay UNP! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international students here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school hello everyone nama saya maria adeline Doroin. i'm from Cabi state university philippines is worth to remember and worth to share to the world UNP. other facilities include a medical clinic international student dormitories, the UNP hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international students here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Universitas Negeri Padang Establish in 1954 Under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh I am Profesor Ganevri PhD Director of Universitas Negeri Padang Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school hello everyone nama saya maria adeline Doroin. i'm from cabbie state university philippines is worth to remember and worth to share to the world Mabuhay, UNP. other facilities include a medical clinic international student dormitories the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international students here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Can you hear me? Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Says my daughter Margaret, have some trouble in connecting. So we still could not check with our team speaker whether uh, we could continue. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me, please? 
I can't hear yes. you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Huh? I can't hear you. So, is there any problem with the microphone? There. We just heard you. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, you are breaking. I, I'm not sure about my voice. Can you hear me? Very clear now. How about... Hi. Yes, yes, yes. Then we are good to go? Yeah. Okay. Can. We will start. Right. right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are very happy that our keynote speakers has already with us in the Zoom meeting room. So we shall, uh, we shall start this uh, third keynote session. Um, before we start, allow me to read the short biography of our third uh, keynote speaker. Associate uh, Professor Dr. Mageswari Karpudewan uh, is from University Science Malaysia. Uh, from School of Educational Studies. She earned her PhD from University Science Malaysia in 2010, and her specialization is in science education. Nowadays, she teaches mostly in postgraduate level of chemistry and science teaching related courses, such as chemistry teaching method, teaching and science concepts, and other courses. Throughout her career, she has been awarded numerous awards from prestigious institutions, both from Malaysia and foreign countries. If I were to mention some of the latest, from University Science Malaysia, she has been awarded Anugrah Sanggar Sanjung in 2020 in publication category, Outstanding Editor in 2019, also in publication and research category, and also Outstanding Educator in 2018, also in publication category. So we could see that Dr. Magas is really into publication. From abroad, she has been awarded American Chemical Society Travel Award in 2017 from San Francisco, California, United States. An award for incorporating sustainability into chemistry education, award in 2014 from American Chemical Society, Dallas, Texas, United States. Dr. Magas also has several experiences as associate editors and editorial board members for reputable international journals, such as Journal of Science Teacher Education, Asia Pacific Education and Educator, International Journal of Science and Mathematics Education, Frontiers in Education, and also some other journals. In addition to this, Dr. Magas also has been assigned as reviewers for, from uh, 12 reputable international journals, such as Chemistry, Education, Research and Practice, International Journal of Science and Mathematics Education, and Eurasia Journal of Science, Mathematics and Technology Education. I believe that chemistry and science educators are familiar with the journals that Dr. Magas has been assigned as reviewer for. Currently, Dr. Magas has four copyright and patents registered under her name in science education, and she also has three ongoing grants, one in STEM education and two in stream education. Until now, Dr. Magas has supervised 19 graduate students and 10 postgraduate students. Dr. Magas has also published 43 articles in reputable international journals, mostly indexed in Scopus, and 37 proceedings or conference papers from prestigious conferences in Malaysia and Japan. Without further ado, please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Mageswari Karpudewan. Thank you, uh, Dr. Monica. 
um, I'm so sorry for the delay. I have some problem here. It's not actually a technical problem, but the rain here is extremely heavy. You know, so our internet is down at uh, USM at this moment. So I had so much of problem getting this thing uh, ready to be on air. So I'm really sorry and uh, I apologize, apology from me, from my side. Okay. Actually, I was prepared at about 11 when I want to start connecting. The rain was terrible. I, I don't think we had this kind of rain in Penang. Uh, Earlier, well, this is that's really okay, bad. I guess. That's okay. Don't worry. Don't yeah. worry. Don't worry. We really yeah. understand that, and we are happy that you are here with us. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monica. So, uh, let me start with my presentation. Can you see my PowerPoint slides? I'm yes. sharing the slide. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you. Uh, I have to. Um, uh, I, I'm not using your background because of the uh, bandwidth. I'm. The bandwidth is not so strong, the internet connection at this point. Uh, so I took out the, my technician told me to remove the uh, background. So I'm not using any background. Okay. Uh, I think, right. can you hear the rain outside there? It's really, really heavy. Okay. So let's start. Uh, very good afternoon to all the participants. It's about 12.33 here. I, I, I'm thinking it's uh, 11.33 in Indonesia back there. So very good morning and uh, over here, uh, very good afternoon to um, uh, the conference organizers, uh, uh, to the participants, and also the keynote address, uh, uh, keynote addresser one and two. I, I'm I'm thinking they are here. If they are here, a uh, very good afternoon to them uh, as well. And um, I would like to uh, really thank the conference organizer for inviting me to uh, address. Uh, the keynote speech uh, for this uh, conference. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Uh, so today, uh, uh, I don't know whether I will have time to uh, share the entire thing, but I'll try my best to deliver whatever I supposed to uh, share with all of you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about green chemistry from teacher education program to secondary schools and how and where to move forward. So um, I have been, uh, just to give you some uh, background uh, uh, background uh, information about uh, myself and my engagement in green chemistry. So I have been working uh, in the green chemistry, uh, the research in green chemistry in education for the past 10 years. And uh, we have started with introducing green chemistry in teacher education program. So what Excuse we did me. was uh, we, we uh, trained the chemistry teachers on uh, green chemistry, on how to use green chemistry in the schools. And progressively from the teacher education program, we move, uh, uh, move to the schools, to tech secondary schools, to, uh, to see how um, uh, we can actually integrate green chemistry in secondary schools. And we have been doing some, uh, re, uh, some work with uh, many secondary schools in the northern region of uh, Malaysia uh, to see how uh, students can learn chemistry using green chemistry. Rather than uh, uh, introducing green chemistry as a new curriculum, our intention is to ensure that students learn the existing chemistry in a greener manner whereby we integrated the 12 principles of green chemistry in teaching and learning of chemistry. So we have been doing that kind of work to this point of time. And where are we moving forward? And what, how are we going to move forward? And where are we going to move forward? So this is uh, some information where I'm going to share uh, with the participants um, uh, of this conference. Okay. So first- Excuse me, Dr. Magas. Excuse yeah, yeah. me, Dr. Magas. Could you please uh, put on the slideshow for oh, the presentation? Okay. I hope it's okay with the bandwidth. All right, yeah. that's is perfect. Okay, right, okay. So what is the issues in science education generally and in chemistry education specifically that actually necessitate us to uh, look into the ways to bring ke green chemistry into the education? So if we look into the school curriculum, so what is happening, or not only in school curriculum, as in undergraduate level as well, we in science courses, we try to focus on um, very specific concepts, whereby we ask the students to memorize uh, concepts which are very, very 
specific. Okay, so when the students won't learn the concepts in uh, the uh, uh, the specific concept, what happens is they do not know how to apply it into a general context. So science education become a uh, or chemistry become a very dry concept where they have to memorize the facts. Okay, so. So as times go on, people become specialized in science. You know, they become very, very much. Uh, uh, we can say they are specialist, specialist in science. But when come to the real world problem, real world context, they are unable to apply whatever they have uh, learned in the uh, uh, in the classroom or in the at the undergraduate level to the real world context. So that means we we are successful successful in the in developing or the uh, 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 in uh, educating uh, uh, science majors become a science specialist, but we are not really educating the majors to become a scientifically literate citizens. You know, so we are not actually educating uh, the general uh, students to become scientifically literate, but rather than that, we are producing scientists which are special, which are whom they are. Uh, they are uh, become um, what do you call that? They specialize in certain area and they become specialists in that particular area. You know, so that's why we can see that uh, from botany or zoology, which is the courses which are more general. In uh, nowadays, it is more focused into the genetics or molecular biology, which is more narrow and uh, which reflects specialization in, in, in an area. So I'm not telling that being a specialist in an area is not good, but rather I'm telling that that is one part of science, but we also have to look in another part of science whereby our intention not only to produce specialists, but we are also producing the specialists which, would, which you are aware of what's happening of, outside there, which know how to apply the scientific knowledge uh, to the daily uh, uh, scenario or daily problem. And at the same time, we our intention also to make sure that the pe people who are learning science, the students who are learning science are, the, are, are scientifically literate. That means every aspect uh, around us can be scientifically defined. So that means they should know how to use the scientific knowledge in the classroom to solve the problem that they encounter in their daily life. So, so develop, uh, preparing scientists is one aspect of science education, but that's not the ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, intention of science education. But in a broader view, we have to prepare a general public or uh, uh, who are scientifically literate. So for example, if you just looking at a single brick uh, of a building, you won't appreciate the entire building. So in Malaysia, we have Petronas Twin Tower. So if you just look at a brick of the building, you would never appreciate the entire, uh, uh, the beauty of the building, you know? So we have to see the entire building to appreciate the beauty and the value of the building. So same goes to the scientific facts. So we have Dal Dalton's idea about atom. So if you just look about, uh, you know, we, are, we, we teach or we ask the students specifically to refer to atom, probably they would not know what is the application of the knowledge about atom. So we have to show the students the wider knowledge about atom. So that is, uh, that in that way, we would allow students to see the application of knowledge about atom in their daily life, okay? So it's not about, so what, what kind of a transition is required? You know, what, what, what kind of transition are we looking forward? So we, we require uh, individuals more than a knowledge of basic concept, but a vision, how such knowledge is related to the events around them. You know, so now we are talking about climate change. That is the tremendous, Climate change has a tremendous impact in everyday life. You know, our, our activities are affected. So no point talking about greenhouse gases and then they do not know how to apply the knowledge of greenhouse gases in their uh, daily life. So as such, therefore, uh, we are not only focusing on producing intellectual products, but we have to produce uh, products who can apply scientific knowledge across their 
uh, life. So we call it as a, a li lifelong learning as well. So in that case, how we can do it, how we can materialize in the uh, school curriculum or undergraduate curriculum. So for example, in, in USM, Oh, I'm I, I I'm pretty sure in uh, all the um, uh, uh, public universities in Malaysia, we have a set of curriculum. You know, we don't have the authority to uh, change or manual the curriculum according to our needs. You know, we can't do that. If you want to do that, we have to seek permission. We have to uh, seek the approval of Senate. You know, to go through all this process. Same thing at the school level. At the school school level, the teachers are give, given a set of curriculum where they have to strictly follow the curriculum uh, in order to prepare the students for the year-end examination. So the teachers do not have any authority to edit or uh, uh, modify the curriculum. So how, as I said, if we want to produce a scientist which, uh, who are scientifically literate, we have to introduce a curriculum which enable them to become uh, scientifically literate citizen. So one way to do that is to bring green chemistry. So our concern is if the undergraduate level is very much uh, 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 structured, the school level curriculum is also very much structured. So how are we going to introduce green chemistry in the curriculum? So based on my research with a group of researchers in my team, as I said, we have been working on green chemistry for the past 10 years and we have published in a uh, reputable journals specifically in a q1 SS, uh, SSEI journals regarding how we have implemented green chemistry across undergraduate and uh, teacher education curriculum so what we did was rather than introducing green chemistry as a new curriculum we transformed the existing curriculum by integrating the principles of green chemistry so that we are not restructuring the curriculum, but we are providing or we are, we are telling or showing the teachers on how you can use green chemistry principle. You integrate the green chemistry principle in the existing That's curriculum uh, without actually modifying or without actually changing the structure of curriculum uh, to deliver or uh, to uh, deliver green chemistry. In other words, you can actually uh, teach existing uh, uh, concept, uh, existing curriculum, but you integrate the principles of green chemistry. Uh, uh, in a way, it show it gives you the path uh, to implement green chemistry in the uh, schools and also at the undergraduate level. So, uh, our intention is uh, very much in line with the uh, mission and vision of uh, University uh, Science Malaysia which is ensuring sustainability of tomorrow. So I don't have any problem. I, we, we, our research group did not really encounter much problem of uh, 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 implementing green chemistry or integrating green chemistry into the existing curriculum because it is very much in line with the vision and mission of the uh, university. So we, we get many supports, various supports from the uh, administrative of the university as, as well as also from my dean, uh, School of Educational Studies dean, uh, they have uh, have um, tremendous contribution for the success of the curriculum. So uh, we started with um, so uh, um, uh, why we the, the the triggering point for us to uh, uh, have uh, uh, green chemistry into the curriculum is because. Um, after reading the book by Silent Spring, uh, the book by Rachel, Cash, uh, Rachel uh, Carson, the title of the uh, book is Silent Spring. Hello, Dr. Magens. It seems like uh, Dr. Magas experienced uh, trouble in connection again. Uh, participants, please uh, kindly wait until Dr. Magas can join us again.
Okay, got disconnected again. Welcome back, Dr. Magas. Yeah, yeah. So we got disconnected again. So uh, this is uh, what I'm. Uh, can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay. So where are we moving forward? You know, uh, we have done done this much. You know, we have done with the teacher education curriculum. We have done with the secondary school. You know, uh, the work with secondary school is keep. Uh, 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 progressing. So, where are we leading to after this? Okay. So, when we conducted the research on green chemistry teaching and learning at secondary school, and also training the teachers, on one of the main problems that we discovered is um, teachers lacking the theoretical support to uh, to base on to execute their teaching on. Uh, green chemistry. So as we know in social science, in educational research, theoretical support is, is instrumental to ensure the uh, uh, execution of any uh, program is uh, successful. So it is very important for, for us to have a, a very strong theoretical support to execute uh, to ensure the sustainability of uh, implementation of green chemistry. So based on what I've showed just now, the two uh, at the secondary school and also, and also at the uh, 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 teacher education level, it's mostly based on uh, introducing the principles of green chemistry, um, changing the materials, using more benign materials and so on. But since there is no theoretical support, theoretical support uh, the teacher seems to not able to bring the execution of green chemistry to an advanced level. So we continue researching on how we should overcome this problem. So this is my uh, uh, post uh, graduate student. She has ac actually graduated. So I would like to show a work what we have been doing uh, collaboratively. So what we did was we tried to use activity theory based green chemistry experiment. So we brought activity theory into the uh, 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 integrated with the principles of green chemistry and executed in the in the uh, schools. So our uh, pilot project, this is our pi pilot project. So this pilot project was conducted with three university students at an at a matriculation college. So let me just walk through uh, uh, all of you about what is activity theory. So activity theory, there are a few generations. The first generation, it says that basically activities theory sees any teaching and le learning activity as an activity system. Okay, the, the activity theory views uh, any activity that you conduct in the classroom as a system. Okay, so if it is a system, it must have tools. Okay, it ha must have tools. So the first generation activity tools, activity uh, uh, theory says that it has three tools or three elements. The first one is the subject. It can be individual, the group, or the person who conduct the activity, the object or the motive, objective of the lesson, which is also the outcome, and the tools. What are the mediating tools? So in our laboratory system, we have our lab equipment. We have the laboratory manual. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, computer assisted laboratory learning, you know, all these are mediating tools, you know. So progressively it went to second generation. In the second generation, it, we can see the number of elements is imp improved. So that means in the first generation, there's only three elements, but in the second generation, we could see there are six to seven elements. So we have rules, we have community, division of labor, object, mediating tools, subject, you know. So these are the elements of uh, activity theories. So we employed the second generation activity theory and the elements and we embedded within uh, our uh, uh, national curriculum. And at the same time, we used uh, these uh, elements, th six elements to uh, bring the implementation of uh, green chemistry. So this is the third generation. A uh, third generation is a bit complicated, so we thought of not doing the third generation with green chemistry. We just focus on the second generation. So in the second generation, 
you have mediating tools, which is the laboratory experiment, uh, the equipment, uh, uh, and we also had augmented, really, uh, augmented reality-based green chemistry experiment, computerized way of learning green chemistry. And uh, the, the subjects here are the students, okay, the learner. The rules are set by the teacher or the educator. The community here, it's not only about the students, but we have the community of educators. Uh, we have uh, uh, the teachers, we have the science education community from the university taking part. We have the community surrounding the schools taking part. And we have something called division of labor, whereby the students are uh, uh, divided or assigned with tasks. You know? So they are divided into groups and they were assigned with tasks to execute the lesson. And the final element is the objective, whether combination of all these elements uh, results in achieving the objective of the lesson or the motive of the lesson, okay, right. So this is some elaboration about the uh, gener uh, second generation of activity theory. Uh, I could share this slide with you later. Uh, this is also some elaboration of activity theory. Uh, I, I, I don't want to take uh, another person's uh, timing. Uh, so let me go through the most important uh, part of the uh, talk. And then uh, I have talked about some usage of activity theory. It is, uh, it is actually based on social uh, socio-constructivism by uh, uh, Vygotsky. Uh, the early work of Vygotsky, social constructivism. Uh, activity theory is based on social constructivism. Vygotsky is the one who introduced activity theory, but then it was kept uh, hidden. In fact, it is known as a hidden secret in education. So only in 1980s, 1990s, people have, researchers have worked on activity theory. And in year 2000, it became full-fledged. People, researchers has been using activity theory. So we can see that activity theory is used in information, communication, ICT research, mathematics education, art, arts education, language education, science education but not really into the chemistry education or into the green chemistry. So uh, this is some information about past studies. Um, let me show you how uh, merging of activity theory. So we design activity theory-based green chemistry uh, experiments in four phases, okay? The activities are designed in four phases. The phase one is pre-lab, activity which is given uh, two days prior to the activity, phase two during the activity, phase three post lab after the uh, activity, and phase four extended post lab. So this is either, there are two ways we conducted the phase four. We conducted uh, in, in person uh, uh, in the classroom, and also we combined with the social media platform whereby we used uh, WhatsApp and also we used uh, Facebook and Instagram to uh, uh, in the phase four. So generally, the, the activity were conducted in four phases. Okay, so I'll show you some example. So uh, one of the example that I would like to share with you is the uh, uh, filter paper, electrochemical cell and green chunk and foil. So this lab, is intended to assist students to arrange metals in an electrochemical series experimentally and also identify oxidation and reduction uh, uh, reactions, okay? So, so uh, in the, uh, uh, this is the experiment. So what we did was in the pre-lab, two days prior to the experiment, uh, we prepared a context or questions and uh, 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 that actually can uh, guide the students or prepare the students to the real lab, you know. So they are not coming to the lab with empty mind, but they are coming to the lab with uh, answers to a set of uh, questions. And these questions we give them earlier and the students have to explore and to find the answers for the questions. Okay? So in the process of finding the answers, not everybody could get the answers, but they also encounter problem issues. Uh, 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 they have multiple uh, answers for the question, so they are unable to decide which is the right answer for this question. So this 
are the questions that actually they are they have tested in the pre lab in the in the real laboratory context so in the uh, in the real laboratory concept so for example in the pre lab context one uh, the context given was the ring you bought a couple of weeks ago is already turning your finger green and looks dark another ring that you had for years still looks almost new why is this so so this was the context given so the student have to go and find solution or prepare suggestion for the context given okay so together with this context they were also given questions you know the questions are do you think the following reaction would occur explain so that means they have to relate the reaction with the context so this is pre lab context so in the pre lab context the students search information plan and ex ex investigation so that means there is a subject tool object there is a link three uh, the triangle uh, the link between the element subject element tool and element object the the part on activity theory so a uh, teacher randomly selects students to present their findings on the pre lab context and also experimental procedures okay so when they have explanation for the con uh, the context they also design uh, uh, how they going to uh, plan an experiment to test the context so this is also explained in terms of activity theory so the phase 2 is during the experiment so this is about 60 minutes students uh, uh, should have a total of 50 electrochemical cells and then filter paper like we prepared the electrochemical uh, series using filter paper and they tested the reaction using the filter paper so the activity 2 is the green chunk and foil and a teacher observed the experiment being done and how students record the data so students conduct the experiment at the same time teacher facilitated the students with the experiment so in this uh, phase also you can see the elements of activity uh, theory taking place the next is a uh, phase 3 after the experiment so this is conducted in the classroom whereby a uh, uh, group presents their results to other groups and whole class students may check on their any discrepancy of the voltage readings obtained so they compare their findings between groups and also Uh, uh uh they present to the whole class and also they make the comparison uh with the other groups same thing for the activity uh, uh two for the uh, green chart also they have a list of questions where they prepare the answer and they compare the finding with the other groups so here we can see that uh, the elements of activity theory has been executed and in phase 4 this part we presented we extended we, we couldn't do it in the lab time but we extended the discussion about the context of relating the finding of the experiment in the real lab with the context that they have actually uh, uh, provided in the pre lab so they have to connect the finding of the uh, real lab and the context that has been given in the pre lab so together uh, they the finding is discussed in the whatsapp uh, group uh, chat we couldn't do it in the real uh, in the classroom in person but we extended the learning to the uh, uh, whatsapp uh, group presentation okay so this is how it is uh, uh, conducted the activity theory uh, based green chemistry experiment so this is one example that we have uh, uh, prepared uh, uh, in our uh, curriculum for uh, pre university level matriculation level and we are hoping that we can produce more of green chemistry uh, based on activity theory so this is the traditional experiment but with the green chemistry uh, we uh, uh, int uh, introduce uh, uh, you can actually decide the electrochemical series of uh, the metal uh, just using a filter paper reaction so we have the principle of uh, uh, green chemistry principle of prevention and uh, uh, integrated within this experiment so we have a list of 11 experiments which we have actually prepared based on activity theory green chemistry experiment and this work is still progressing and one of our initial publication we expected to be published in the green uh, chemistry education research and practice uh, 
next year uh, on activity theory. So we are working on, uh, on that uh, dimension. And then we tested how activity theory uh, based green chemistry uh, improved uh, students' uh, uh, view about chemistry laboratory learning environment. So we checked on the students' cohesiveness. We checked on their view on a students uh, about open-endedness, open integration, rule clarity, and material environment. So generally, uh, we did both uh, quanti and quality analysis. Uh, we got, uh, got to know that the students have a positive uh, percep perception about the chemistry laboratory learning environment, except that uh, the point of integration is not so much of uh, uh, transparent in the experiment, and also uh, uh, material environment is also, there are some limitation in, in that point, but generally the rules are clear, integration is uh, clear, you know. So uh, we are still working uh, uh, to improvise uh, these dimensions of the uh, 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 laboratory learning environment. But our qualitative finding says that students experience an open-ended approach. So they were given total freedom to explore uh, uh, the learning context. You know, they are not restricted by a recipe-like procedures whereby they have to strictly follow, but they were totally given openness. They can explore. And then end of the day, they come with the finding. So the finding not, not necessarily be uh, the uh, accurate or perfect finding, but with the facilitation of the teacher, the finding is further improvised. Okay, so and students also, uh, we have some contradictive finding uh, between quantity and qualities in the, uh, 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 in the uh, quantity, uh, the material environment, it is nearly said adequate, it's not, uh, uh, expressive, but in 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 the quality, we, they said that the it, the experiment provided a, a good material environment. So there is a lot of contradictory finding which we are still working on to improvise on it, right? So uh, at this point of time, it is very early for me to uh, say AT activity theory was found to be a good platform, but for the work we have done so far we can see that uh, implementation of green chemistry is made explicit with activity theory. Before the activity theory, it's more of like, uh, there is no uh, a concrete uh, uh, platform or concrete uh, uh, platform for the student, teachers to lay the activities, you know, the, the experiments. But with the activity theory, they have a very strong uh, theoretical support to uh, plan the activity and execute in the, uh, 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 in the classroom. So the, all this work are still at very early stage. We are progressing. Hopefully in next years to come, we can come up with a more conclusive finding on how activity theory could be a good way to integrate green chemistry. So I think um, uh, I, I am done. Uh, for today's, uh, actually, I have many experiments to share with you, but unfortunately, due to time constraint, I have to stop the experiments. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my talk. Right. Thank you, Dr. Margesh, for the nice presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, we have seen the presentation and we have listened together that the ultimate goals of science education is not only to create scientists, but also to create intellectual human being who can understand and apply science concept in daily life. Dr. Magas has shared with us about activity theory and how it can be integrated to apply a green in the green chemistry. Right now, uh, we would like to invite participants uh, who have any questions for uh, Dr. Magas. You could use the ch uh, chat room in the Zoom meeting, or you could use uh, the right hand feature so that we could notice.
Again, I would like to invite participants if you have any questions for our keynote speakers. You can also email the question to me, Dr. Monica, if you have any question that you might, you uh, know, participants not, don't, uh, I mean, they are less comfortable to ask in right. the public, they can always email me. Mm -hmm. I can respond to the question. About the experiments, if you want to have uh, any of exp my experiments, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, willing to share. Maybe you can try out in the Indonesian context whether it works or not, you know. So... Uh, that is also a good thing to see whether activity theory can be executed uh, uh, in a different uh, uh, context rather than in Malaysia alone. Right. That is very, very kind of you, Dr. Magas, and we really appreciate that. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, participants, uh, it was very informative, the presentation from Dr. Magas, because we could see that there are a lot of things that we could measure from the students. Oh. Uh, there there's one question in the chat box. Uh, let me read the question. I will read the questions for you. Um, right. The question is from Rifa Cahaya Putri. Uh, Dr. Mageswari, may I ask some of the issues that have been raised in issues with current science education. How do we solve this problem so it doesn't happen again in the future? That is the first question, Dr. Magis. Hmm. Um, thank you for the question, uh, Rivia Cahaya Putri. Uh, I'm not sure she's referring to uh, what problem or which problem, but uh, generally in science education, the concern is I'm talking about uh, uh, teacher education problem uh, program as well as the secondary chemistry of uh, or general science uh, education. The the main concern with students losing interest or they are not really motivated to learn science is because high emphasis on learning uh, science concepts, specific concepts. Like for example. In, we, we emphasize so much on moles, you know, uh, how to calculate moles, you know, when there is change, changes in the mass, how the number of, how the concentration changes uh, uh, and so on. But we don't really explain to the students or we don't really show them why this concept is important in our life. You know, we are experiencing energy uh, deficiency, energy crisis, we have uh, climate change issues. We have so many other problems. How these concepts can assist us to um, not to say entirely address or resolve the, the world problem. We can't do that. But at least the students should know how this knowledge is applicable in their daily life so that it is a kind of solution. They can, they can actually execute to their capacity uh, uh, at home, you know, we can't change the world just in a lesson. We can't do that, you know. We 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 cannot be very ambitious, but we can start small by not really, you know, demanding the students to go and memorize scientific facts, but actually they do not know how to apply the facts. Uh, that is my concern. So with the green chemistry you are actually showing the students the activities, the experiments, which you are actually exposing the students like on how you can apply the concepts in the everyday life. You know, so that is one way of addressing the problem, but we can't actually entirely resolve the problem. That is quite impossible. You know, you know, so when with the green chemistry principle, we talk about education for sustainable development. We have three pillars on education for sustainable development and so on. So when this information is imparted to the students from early stage of schooling, so when they grow up, become a chemist or chemical engineer or some um, uh, uh, spe uh, specialization in chemistry, they not only know about the chemistry chemistry uh, knowledge, but they also know they are concerned about the three pillars of sustainable development we have embedded in the 
the principles of green chemistry which we have embedded with. So we need to educate them from the beginning, early stage of schooling. And teachers play a very important role. This information would not go to the students if the teachers are not informed. So start from the teacher education program, then we are expanding to the schools. So that could be one way. Right. Thank you, Dr. Magas. Uh, Rifa, Cahaya Putri, I hope that answered the questions. Dr. Magas has a very nice message. We could start from the teacher, chemistry teacher education problem to address the issue. Not only concerned about teaching the concept, but how to apply the concept to help solving the problems in daily life. That is a very, very good answer, Dr. Magas. Actually, I would agree with you. And then we have a second question uh, from Hasbia Husna. Good afternoon, Dr. Mageswari. Thanks for your pre nice presentation. I'd like to ask how this knowledge is applied in the school setting so that global sustaining principles can be caught by the next generation. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's a good question actually. Um, you see, like as I said, in Malaysia, even, even at the tertiary level uh, uh, at USM, we have a very structured programs, you know. So we, our teacher education program is very structured. So I'm in charge for chemistry teacher education program. So I cannot simply go and change the program without getting permission from the Senate of the university. I don't have the authority to do that. Similarly, for school teachers, they are provided with uh, document known as document standard DSKP, document standard curriculum, you know. So this document actually lists all the concepts or, or uh, uh, content that the teacher should deliver to the students. And very important for the teachers to strictly follow this curriculum because at the end of the uh, year, they, the students will be tested for the uh, based on uh, the DSKP. And the questions are set by the uh, Ministry of Education. So if the teacher do not follow the system, the, the DSKP, the document, then she ended up teaching something else and the student would not be able to perform. You know, the teacher will be blamed for that, right? So we don't have that authority go, to go and change things. So what we did was, we retained the curriculum, you know, but we changed, that's why we introduced uh, green chemistry as the laboratory-based pedagogy. So that means we don't change the system, but we change the, the way the content is delivered. So for example, rate of reaction, rather than using sodium thiosulfate and uh, uh, sulfuric acid, we train the teachers how you can teach the same concept using vitamin C clock reaction. So you react the vitamin C uh, tablet, as, uh, ascorbic acid, and in the presence of iodine. So you can actually Google the experiment and you can get a video on how the clock reaction happens. You know, that's a very common experiment actually. So we don't change the system, but without changing the system, the teachers are equipped with knowledge that they can actually integrate in their everyday teaching. So in that way, we are trying to bring the issues of sustainable development uh, in, uh, as, uh, as a green chemistry uh, uh, into the curriculum so that it goes on. You know, once you train the teacher, the teacher, you know, we used to tell um, uh, teacher, pre-service teachers have uh, multiple power. They have access to generation of students. You know, they are not going to teach one year and then, they, you know, they're going to stop and then go to different career. Most of the time, teachers are there in school. Chemistry teachers have been teaching for 10, 20 years. So this is how the knowledge could be uh, uh, brought forward. I hope I answered the question. Right. Thank you, Dr. Magis. Uh, Hasbia Husna, I hope that answered the questions. Right, maybe um, if I can conclude, school setting is really something that um, 
Dr. Magas would call it as a system. So if we couldn't change the system, we could change how we teach every day by integrating green chemistry. Uh, eventually, it, I, uh, hopefully it could add up changing the uh, chemistry teaching in school. Right, yeah. Dr. Magas? Yeah, so, so our intention is to change the mindset of teachers. You know, we have to change the mindset of teachers. We have to educate them that they change the mindset. Once the teacher changes the mindset, definitely what's happening in the school is in their head. Correct? Right. Thank you, Dr. Magas. Uh, I would like to check with our, our participants. Is there any more questions? Right, if, if there is no other questions, uh, I'm afraid that we have to close this keynote session, Dr. Magas, because of the time constraint as well. And before we close the session, as a token of appreciation, we would like to present a certificate to you uh, as a keynote speaker and also for our two previous keynote speakers, uh, Professor Dr. Indang Dewata MSI and also Professor Dr. Lee Yuk Heng. Please wait uh, a moment until our host could share the uh, certificate on the screen. There you go. This one is for Professor Dr. Indang Dewata, our first keynote, session, keynote speaker in the morning. I hope uh, Pak Indang could kindly receive it. And then we move on to the next certificate. This one is for, for Professor Lee Yuk Heng, our second keynote speakers of the day. And then finally, the third one. There you go for Doc, Associate Professor Dr. Mageswari Karpudewan, our third keynote speakers for the day. I hope you could kindly receive it, Dr. Mages. Thank you so much, Dr. Monica. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to once again apologize for the delay just now. Uh, I tried my best to connect by 11, uh, 12 p, uh, p.m. Malaysian time. It was just impossible. So I'm so sorry. And I also would like to apologize the next speaker where I might have taken the speaker's time. I'm, I'm so sorry for that. Right. Uh, Dr. Magas, I think uh, with the condition, uh, we all could understand. It's it's out of everyone's control, right? The heavy right. Correct. Right, uh, if, if uh, that's okay with you, I would like to close this keynote session, Dr. Magas. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manika. And once again, I would like to uh, uh, convey my thanks to the organizer for inviting me. Thanks a lot. So hopefully the next round, I would present myself in person at right, in person. Padang. We would, like to, we would like to serve you here in Padang. Yeah. In the University right. of Padang. Okay. Yeah. Look forward to having you here, Dr. Magas. Yeah, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of our uh, third keynote session. As a moderator, I would like to excuse myself and apologize for any mistakes and misconducts. Uh, I would like to inform you also for participants, uh, we, have, uh, we will have lunch break for about uh, 80 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, and then we will join you will, uh, we will join you again in this Zoom meeting room at 1, 1.20 p.m. Is that correct? Let me check with the committee. Okay, there is a little corrections. We will have a lunch break for 60 minutes. And we will see you again in the Zoom meeting room at 1.30 p.m. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Bapak Ibu peserta dan panitia silakan Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh I am Professor Ganevri PhD Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school hello everyone nama saya maria adeline Doroin. i'm from Cabe state university philippines is worth to remember and worth to share to the world Mabuhay, UNP. other facilities include a medical clinic international student dormitories the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international students here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates, 
and be an international level university. UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities. Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process. 
reset and high quality publication than community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone! Nama saya Maria Adeline Doroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. Mabuhay UNP! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international students here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganefri PhD. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama saya Maria Adeline Doroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. Mabuhay UNP! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international students here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD, Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone! Nama saya Maria Adeline Doroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. Mabuhay UNP! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different properties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international student here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganefri PhD. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school hello everyone nama saya maria adeline Boroin. i'm from Cabe state university philippines is worth to remember and worth to share to the world Mabuhay, UNP. other facilities include a medical clinic international student dormitories, the UNP hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be international students here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD, Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school hello everyone nama saya maria adeline Boroin. i'm from Cabe state university philippines is worth to remember and worth to share to the world Mabuhay, UNP. other facilities include a medical clinic international student dormitories the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international students here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school hello everyone nama saya maria adeline Boroin. i'm from Cabi state university philippines is worth to remember and worth to share to the world UNP. other facilities include a medical clinic international student dormitories, the UNP hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international students here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Zoom meeting. We will continue the next session with first moderator. Please welcome Associate Professor Mithal Kaif. Oke, okay, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will continue our uh, keynote speaker with the new uh, with uh, Professor Romel Hidayat. Uh, before presenting his uh, presentation, I would like to introduce him to you all. His name is uh, Romel Hidayat, and he is from Gwangjin District, Seoul, Seoul, South Korea. And his interest is in broad area in chemistry of material science and molecular modeling. Uh, for example, conductive material, conductive polymers, oxide material for energy devices, multiferric materials, and materials modeling and design using a first principle study. And about his professional qualification, he is now assistant professor at Sejong University, South Korea, and he did his PhD at Sejong University, South Korea. And he also he was also research assistant before in Bandung Institute of Technology, Indonesia, research fellow in University of Groningen, Netherlands, and as a research assistant in Bandung Institute of Technology, Indonesia. And he uh, finished his PhD in uh, in the area of molecular modeling for precursor design, MSc in chemical physics in Groningen. And MSc also in physical and inorganic chemistry in uh, Bandung Institute of Technology for the fast track program, and his BSc is in inorganic chemistry in Bandung Institute of Technology. So from his curriculum vitae, we can see that he is uh, an expert in his in his field. And now we are going to hear uh, his presentation with the title of computational chemistry on precursor, precursor development for atomic layer deposition. Professor Romel Hidayat, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I hope uh, my sound or my voice very clear. And then I'm going to share my screen. And then I think, uh, uh, I hope you all can uh, see my screen. If not, please let me know. It is now seen, Professor Lau. Okay. Please continue. Thank you, uh, Professor Mithal uh, Khair. First of all, thank you very much uh, to the moderator, uh, Professor uh, Mithal Khair. And also, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to uh, Rector and Vice Rector of uh, Universitas of uh, Negeri Padang. And also, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the Dean and Vice Dean of uh, Universitas Negeri Padang. And also, importantly, that uh, I would like to thank to the uh, the chairman of the uh, conference that uh, he contacted me and invited me uh, to give this talk. Okay. Uh, I, I think I will start my uh, presentation now. The title is about the computational chemistry on precursor development 
for atomic layer deposition. So I'm I am uh, one of the faculty in the Department of Nanotechnology and Advanced Materials Engineering in Sejong University, Korea. Okay, uh, the agenda for this uh, presentation, uh, uh, it would be introduction, maybe uh, the the topic or the, uh, it's quite unfamiliar maybe in Indonesia. I will uh, briefly explain and discuss about the atomic layer deposition, uh, and then I will uh, also introduce and discuss about the precursor chemistry and then I will specify my uh, scope and discuss about uh, the use of density functional theory in this in this uh, area and then uh, I will show you one of my work uh, which is uh, precursor design and evaluation by DFT and then I will give you the summary of this talk okay first this is introduction section uh, in this first one, I would like to uh, serve the motivation of the uh, this atomic layer deposition uh, field. Uh, nowadays, uh, semiconductor is everywhere, uh, such as uh, automation, uh, virtual reality, uh, smart airplane, smart vehicle, and absolutely the, the most of uh, driving force for the atomic layer deposition or semiconductor industry or devices is artificial intelligence, internet of things, and big data, which is already used on already started to use in many sectors. And we we will not forget that our laptop, tablet, and cell phone now is going to be optimized uh, day by day, year by year. So uh, I would like to emphasize that semiconductor also is one of the uh, key economy in Korea, and then the Top, top three, uh, uh, the biggest company uh, in uh, which uh, Korea has the company in the semiconductor uh, industry, which is uh, Samsung Electronics and also SK Hynix. They always in the top three uh, position uh, in the uh, this uh, industry area. Okay. So uh, we can imagine that the semiconductor industry is very fast and very very aggressive in the growth, uh, uh, in the economic, in the technology, in the development and innovation. As we can see in this in this slide, that uh, in 1956, uh, uh, we can we can only store five megabytes in in the uh, memory, which has the space the size of the memory device is as large as one one classroom. And it costs about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars America. And now, in two thousand thirteen, I send this uh, this 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 brand, uh, which has a uh, memory uh, size is sixty four gigabyte, and it all it only costs about sixty dollars America. And now it's becoming uh, cheaper. It is because because of the semiconductor devices always uh, getting smaller and smaller and getting uh, cheaper because material consumed very small and also the, uh, the the structure of the device becoming more complex and making the capacity of the device significantly higher than before. And the problem uh, arises here, how we can synthesize uh, the material inside this Three dimensional structure. Uh, we need uh, some of the thin film crows or uh, uh, the materials in the uh, form of thin films should be grown inside the structure. So, one of the solution, maybe the potent, the most potential solution is ALD. And what is ALD? I will explain in the next slide. So I just. Uh, just say a quote as ALD here. Later I will discuss, but as compared with the other thin film growth technique, or we can say thin film growth, we can say also uh, synthesis material in the form of thin film. So we have here ALD and PVD and CVD. This is also thin film growth technique, but ALD has a very good and very uh, remarkable properties because they can. Uh, deposit thin film very conformally in this 3D structure and uniformly. And then 
uh, can control the thickness into sub nanometer dimension. And uh, this step coverage means the conformal. It means we can uh, uniformly or the same thickness here, here, here in every one in the three dimensional structure. So this ALD uh, possible to do it. So not only the 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 in the structure of the semiconductor device, uh, in the, uh, we can say we can imagine semiconductor devices like uh, integrated circuit or IC or chips. So uh, besides that, the LD can also give uh, improvement or enabling or the other technology, yes, such as uh, the many technology now using particles, usually nanoparticles, and we call it as nanotechnology. And uh, from the liquid-based techniques, usually people use soldier uh, synthesis, liquid-based techniques, and it is a uh, very poor efficiency and effectively in the nanoparticle coating, but LD can give a very uh, good uh, uh, coating on the nanoparticle because we can uh, uh, already mention in the previous slide that that coating of uh, using LD can uniformly conformally uh, synthesis a thin film on the uh, uh, on the surface. Okay. Now I would like to uh, say the LD. What is LD? Maybe in the title we can also know that LD is atomic layer deposition. It's able to meet the, the needs for atomic layer control thickness. It is because uh, and also conformal deposition. It is because of se sequential self-limiting surface reactions of the precursor. What is what is the means? The meaning of this one, uh, it we have uh, the precursors uh, introduced in the substrate of this uh, substrate surface, and uh, the precursors only uh, react with the surface, not react with in the gas space. So if they react in the surface, they will form a monolayer, and then it would be there is byproduct, and then we do parting step to remove the byproduct, and then the next step is uh, introducing the uh, precursor B or other precursor and will uh, react with the chemistry of precursor A. Okay. And then also will form like this one. And then uh, by this, this, this process will be repeat. And then one cycle will be say a one ALD cycle. And then it will be repeated blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, like that and cross in this uh, uh, Z direction. And then because of this monolayer or layer by layer growth, the, the ALD enable as possible to deposit film in good uniformity, conformality, and a very smooth film. So uh, regarding the uh, synthesis of materials, not only oxide material, not only nitride, or not only carbide, and, and many, all of, almost all of the inorganic materials already reported and can be grown by LD techniques. And if you are curious about this one, you can visit that the, this website, atomiclimit.com, and then you can find a bunch of information about LD processes. Okay, uh, maybe you cannot imagine uh, more clearly about LD process. Now um, I will uh, discuss and uh, 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 we will discuss more detail about the LD process. So LD process usually consisting of uh, uh, two half cycle reactions. And then uh, in the between half cycle will be parching step or parch. And uh, these two half cycle will uh, form one LD cycle. Okay. And then this one, uh, the, the first half cycle, the precursor will react with the surface and they will grow like this one. And we, we know that the, the monolayer or Langmuir uh, principle that we will grow monolayer uh, species on the surface. And then we have byproduct because there is a reactions. It should be there is byproduct and then purging step using the inner case, such as the argon nit a nitrogen case can remove and evacuate the reaction byproduct into outside of the chamber. Uh, later we will know what is the chamber means. And then, 
uh, the second half cycle, uh, we will introduce the second precursor. Usually we call it as a coreactant, and then the coreactant will react with the chemisorbed precursor A, or I mean the precursor in the first half cycle. And then they react, and then they have byproduct, and then the monolayer like between uh, these two molecules can be grown, such as we have titanium oxide. So we have titanium precursors, and then we have oxygen source, and then we have titanium oxide film. So uh, in the reality, uh, this is schematic, but in the reality, we have the LD reactor like this, and then we have LD chamber, and then we have uh, like a heated uh, uh, place here, and then we put the substrate to grow the uh, thin film by LD. And there is a precursor uh, canister here. Canister means to a container that contain the precursor. And then we have a correctant here. And then we introduce a, a sequentially, deep independently. So precursor first, and then uh, and then close, and then parching step, and then close, and then this one open, and then the uh, correctant will, will introduce in this chamber, and then and then open the parching step, and then uh, will be uh, remove the byproduct to the outside. So briefly like that. Okay. Mm, okay. This is uh maybe we uh, I still uh, describe in the uh, animation. But now I would like to try to discuss in the uh, example of LD of aluminum oxide. So we have uh, LD of aluminum oxide means we have aluminum elements and we have oxygen elements. If we have aluminum elements, we need a precursor of aluminum, which is here trimethyl aluminum. And we, it, if and for the oxygen source, we have uh, water vapor in this case. So uh, maybe I I forget to mention that all of the precursors should be in the gas phase form. So uh, all of the chemical will be introduced in the chamber in the gas phase. Okay, and then uh, I I mentioned before that we have two half cycle that uh, three aluminium uh, will uh, react with the hydroxyl group of the surface. And then the hydrogen will combine with the one metal of the three metal aluminum. Uh, it is difficult to say three metal aluminum. I will call it as TMA. So hydrogen will uh, combine with metal of TMA and then produce byproduct of methyl, methane, CH4. And then CH4 will evacuate by in a purging step. And then the, this will be grown. So there is a, a possibility of two metal remain or one metal remaining on the surface after the chemisorption of this uh, TMA molecule. And then in the second half cycle, water vapor will be introduced into the chamber and we will uh, find that the hydrogen in the water vapor will combine with the remaining uh, uh, metal groups on the chemisorbed TMA and then remove the uh, methane again and then evacuate by partic step. And we can see here in the beginning, we have hydroxyl group. And in the one ALD cycle, we also have a hydroxyl group. It means this, this cycle will be repeated uh, in uh, each uh, one ALD cycle. So uh, for repetition of this one can grow aluminum oxide, aluminum oxide in the C direction. So uh, to uh, know this reaction mechanism, Actually, uh, there is uh, many uh, techniques, but I would like to explain using FTIR for a, a spectroscopy that after uh, chemistry option of TMA, uh, the spectrum will be uh, shown here with the metal or CH uh, stretching. Will uh, There is a peak CH stretching for metal group. And uh, uh, after the water vapor, uh, the metal uh, or CH stretching will be uh, uh, disappear and then the hydroxyl peak will be appear here after the water vapor introduction to the chamber. So usually the, uh, the reaction mechanism uh, characterization is in C2 uh, characterization during the, uh, the deposition process. Okay. Uh, 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 we know that the, the ALD is uh, uh, 
monolayer like layer by layer and then thick, uh, atomic scale control thickness that uh, uh, the the every cycle will grow as same as, same as uh, a previous cycle or the next cycle thickness that we will have a GPC. GPC means gross per cycle because the thickness is uh, linearly uh, uh, linearly increased by uh, increasing the uh, LD cycles. So by using this GPC, we, uh, every every LD process has a, a unique GPC value. So, uh, but the, uh, using this GPC, or uh, we can uh, predict or we can control the thickness of the film which is desired for our application. For example, we we want in the thickness around here and we can uh, extrapolate it here and then we can get obtain the, how many ALD uh, cycles experiment we should be done. And then uh, uh, we have to notice that this GPC will be applied in the ALD window where the GPC is uh, independent, temperature independent. And if the, the temperature is outside of the uh, LD window, uh, it will be temperature dependent. It is because of some uh, uh, phenomena, uh, because uh, in the low temperature, uh, the, the precursor will be has low reactivity or condensation uh, that make uh, the, uh, the GPC higher. And, and also the composition also making the, the GPC higher and then disruption also uh, making the GPC lower than, than in, in LD window regime. Okay. Uh, I would like to emphasize, I would like to emphasize that the LD uh, can be used uh, to deposit materials on any step of the substrates. Uh, such as uh, we have a flexible foil substrate uh, and then we have uh, we can deposit material in the size control nan nanoparticle, and we can also in like this nanoparticle we in the porous uh, materials we can also deposit uniformly uh, LD films, and then also in the uh, uh, nano wire and also uh, encapsulation of the such of, of uh, roughness uh, surface, and also we can selectively deposit a material in the pattern surfaces. And then we can uh, uh, also uh, make a, mat a nano uh, structures materials and also delta doping. And then uh, this is uh, another uh, also nano patterning uh, engineering that we can use ALD deposition. So uh, using this one, uh, we can uh, uh, we can. I mean, LD can uh, deposit material in many uh, many types of the substrate, and LD also has been used for many applications, such as nanoelectronics and quantum technology, and batteries, uh, catalysis, photovoltaics, and many others. I would like to uh, just explain, for example, the LD has been used for nanoelectronics that that is uh, related to the semiconductor. Uh, processes and usually uh, uh, LD is used for conformal deposition of the of, in the multi patterning process where the uh, the patterning is here is uh, very uh, quite large and then uh, after the LD uh, we can uh, obtain the a smaller a pattern and then in gap filling uh, in the 3D name device we can see here the device is very complex it's like a uh, 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 this this 3D structure, it's quite uh, impossible to to insert uh, um, material inside this 3D structure. Uh, this is the example. We can uh, deposit the tungsten LD metal in this in this 3D structure. It's like inserted in the in the 3D structure, and then uh, we have a uniform deposition uh, of the uh, LD film. Uh, on the on the specific uh, surface like this. Okay. Uh, the other application is uh, in the battery, uh, uh, such as LD can be used in the uh, 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 cutter, uh, particle cutter in the battery. Uh, we can uh, uniformly uh, 
use uh, ALT to deposit the uniform film in this uh, particle cutoffs, uh, and then also in the 3D nanostructure uh, cutoff of the battery, and then also uh, in 3D or solid state structure. It is uh, already mentioned in the previous slide that we can deposit the ALT uh, materials in this kind of 3D structures. And then uh, this is uh, uh, one example that LD has been used in the battery uh, application. And LD uh, sought an improved cohesion between the nanoparticles, uh, cathode components, that create mechanically and electronically more robust network between the nanoparticle, and then enhance the electrolyte impregnation. It means, uh, it can uh, improve the uh, battery uh, performance. Uh, it's shown here that the after uh, after uh, or using ALD, the the performance of the battery is in enhanced uh, into one hundred and sixty five percent. Okay, uh, I already mentioned about the the ALD introduction and the application and principle, and then I will go into the propulsion chemistry. Why we uh, uh, we important to do research about the precursor for LD? It is because if we use a different precursor for LD process, it will uh, affect the uh, the properties of the materials, and it should be uh, it should affect the device performance. That's why if we do innovation in the precursor molecule, we will we will uh, significantly. Uh, also give an innovation for device performance, also for the devices. Okay, uh, to to understand what uh, parameters or what a kind of precursor is needed to develop and to to be uh, improved, uh, in here we can uh, understand that the precursor should be volatile and thermally stable, and then because many uh, we should grow. Uh, in the thermal condition because we need thermal uh, uh, in, to, to, in, because in the reaction we have activation energy to, to overcome the activation energy to make the reaction happen. And yeah, the, 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 the precursor should be reactive to the surface. And then uh, we will have a byproduct and byproduct should be unreactive to the chemical precursor. And then byproduct should be volatile also. And then I, uh, the byproduct, uh, usually sometimes the fluorine, chlorine, uh, should be there is no etching to the substrate. And then uh, after the chemisol precursor, the chemisol precursor should be also reactive to the coreactant. Uh, besides that, uh, uh, in the uh, beside in the properties of the precursor molecule, the precursor itself should be liquid or low melting solid. Uh, it, it is useful for, to evaporize the precursor molecule into the uh, gas phase form and then should be high pur purity uh, and then cheap and scalable synthesis and then safe handling and non, non toxic. And then, a uh, uh, precursor uh, for a uh, uh, LD process, uh, I can uh, conclude that the precursor should be ha uh, having high reactivity and should be having uh, thermal stability and volatility, absolutely. But uh, 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 we can in, uh, design and modify the uh, structural of a precursor molecule by changing the R group or methyl group, or alkyl group, uh, that, that, is, can, that, is, that can, uh, how to say, that can uh, modify the properties of volatility and, mel uh, uh, and melting point also. Uh, related to the evaporation, evaporation of process, and usually the 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 shorter uh, alkyl group will easily to be volatile, and the larger uh, alkyl group will uh, will be stable. So there is a trade of uh, properties between each other. So we have to uh, find the merit of this uh, this uh, uh, parameter. And sometimes we also need uh, to uh, put a combination of different ligand type into one precursor. So I need to mention that precursor molecule, uh, uh, maybe here, yeah, precursor molecule uh, usually has one metal center and then 
the the surrounding of the metal center having uh, organic liquid. So to to modify to expect the 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 properties of the stability and activity of the precursor molecule, we can uh, uh, we can uh, we can use a, a density functional theoretical property or TFP uh, to expect the, the properties. It is because we have a, a precursor in the gas space. Uh, I also uh, forget to mention that the, the, the position process usually in the vacuum, uh, almost vacuum uh, condition. And then usually the FT can expect the properties of the molecule in the vacuum, uh, vacuum condition. And then also usually the precursor molecule in the at a um, strong level or nanometer level uh, dimension. So uh, now I I already mentioned that precursor chemistry. I uh, what properties is needed to be improved, to be to be innovative, to be uh, modified, and to be designed. And now we we discuss about the the use of DFT. So. Uh, we know that uh, uh, so many organic or organo metallic uh, molecules and uh, or compounds uh, is, which is used for homogeneous catalysis and also to be used as a uh, or, uh, organometallic dyes in the dye sensitized solar cell and many other applications. And we know there is a bunch of uh, organic uh, ligand library in the literature, patents, and also in the book. And we can use that ligand. To combine with the certain metal center, and then we can screen that that uh, organometallic precursor by using TFT. And what 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 kind of the property we can we can use to screen that that organometallic uh, compounds, uh, which is which is uh, energy formation. Energy formation usually we can compare that there is more sta uh, the stability between one precursor to other precursor. Homolumo gap and also bond dissociation energy of the uh, uh, organometallic compounds. And then sometimes we can find so many candidates for the new precursors. And then usually here in Korea, we do uh, a collaboration with the chemical company or the another university to synthesize that uh, our uh, finding on the candidate for the new ALD precursors. And usually not always uh, success to, the, to, to synthesize that precursor. But the collaboration, uh, uh, I mean, the aggressive and then also uh, massive uh, collaboration can uh, realize one or until uh, several number of precursors. And then, I, as I mentioned, that uh, we have do innovation in the precursors. It means we do innovation in ALD process. Uh, in the further uh, uh, design, uh, we can do a DFT calculation of the expect the relative stability, the activity, and we can also expect their uh, reaction mechanism. So this is an uh, example from the literature. In this in this uh, precursor, uh, in the initial one, we model that, that there is hydrogen migration from the organic ligand, which is this, is, this one, isopropyl uh, group, which is, has which has one hydrogen can migrate from the organic ligand to the metal center, and then uh, this this obtain uh, the low activation energy. It means that the precursor is easily to thermalize, uh, and then when we uh, change uh, substitute the hydrogen with the metal, uh, we we will have here terse butyl. Uh, it will be difficult to be thermalized, and besides that. The, yeah. It indicates we can uh, uh, modify uh, the structural of uh, uh, precursor molecule, uh, and then besides that, we also can uh, uh, yeah. expect to to find the spec uh, vector ligand. We we have here cyclopentadienyl or CP ligand and methyl ligand, and usually CP ligand is a spec vector ligand. This this already available in the market for the precursor molecule, but we can change this uh, spectator ligand in uh, different ligands. Uh, they tested many ligands and they found that this three is the most uh, 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 stable one. And then methyl is also stable, but the methoxide more stable than CP or methyl. 
So we can expect the new structure of the photosynthesis molecule by using the FP. So uh, besides the uh, stability, we also can expect the reactivity of the uh, ALD precursors, which is uh, using hydrolysis. Hydrolysis means we react the precursor molecule with water. It mimics the, uh, the surface model where we have hydroxyl groups with the uh, methyl, with the one gun on the surface. Well, how favorable the reactions, that, that means the, the, more power, the more preferable the precursor is. Uh, for example, this is um, uh, my publication about the hafnium uh, with the CP ligand and then 3 dimethyl amido ligand and uh, react with the water molecule. And then we found that the, the, the uh, link ligand uh, from the CP with the amido ligand more favorable to react with the water as compared with the CP with 3 dimethyl amido ligand. And also in other uh, uh, in other paper, we found that the uh, uh, hydrolysis uh, can found uh, several potential of cerium tertium precursor as their ALD oxide processes. So usually we use a water uh, a molecule to check the reactivity of uh, the molecule in the gas phase. Uh, it is preliminary uh, study for the reactivity, and then. Finally, we need to check the reactivity uh, on the surface because it can simulate and model the actual uh, surface uh, reactions uh, between the precursor and the, uh, with the substrate surface. And here we have uh, two kinds of uh, uh, silicon uh, precursor, which is silen, FIH4, and this, there is uh, amino silen which is the silicon precursor with two hydrogen and two dimethyl, two dimethyl amido lican. So in this reaction, they has an energy diagram uh, showing that the amino silent has low activation energy. It is because the self-catalysis uh, self phenomena uh, because of the amino, amido lican is a basic and then hydroxyl group is an acid. And when as a basic and acid is interact each other, they will lower the activation energy of the surface reactions of this precursor. As compared to the silent, there is no acid, uh, the strong interaction between the ligand and the hydroxyl group as compared to this amino silent. That's why the activation energy higher than, than that one. So it is very useful to understand the ALD process and then to, to, to give a better suggestion an improvement for ALD process. So now I would like to uh, uh, move to my work about the precursor design and evaluation by DFT. So it is published in the uh, uh, 2021 about the D uh, almost fully DFT about the uh, uh, half name precursor with link amidocyclope and pentadiene lincoln. So why we need to develop this uh, precursor? Uh, absolutely, the LD for uh, hafnium of dioxide, uh, because hafnium of dioxide has been used as the gate dielectric in CMOS device and BRAM devices, because these two devices is very important in the semiconductor in this thing. And also recently, uh, hafnium showing that the ferroelectricity property and then ferroelectricity is now is gaining attention. Uh, for the uh, neuromorphic uh, uh, devices, which is also good for uh, artificial intelligence and also machine learning uh, chips, uh, I mean processor uh, the, uh, material. And LD of half new oxide is usually enabled the miniaturization of and, and uh, of the this material uh, into the device, and also uh, the LD of half new oxide can be used uh, to deposit in the complex architecture of the device. And the more, the higher the temperature of uh, LD process usually will give the better property of the material and devices. That, uh, this is, uh, I would like to uh, uh, recall again the, the, the process of uh, ALD, which is a compound uh, consisting of uh, two, process, two high, uh, half cycle, half new precursor and oxygen source. Usually oxygen source in the industry 
is preferable to use ozone because ozone is very effective as compared to uh, oxygen or water vapor. And, and also usually ozone will oxidize very fast uh, as compared uh, faster as compared to ozone. And then uh, in this case, we will uh, consider the development of hafnium cryptoprene. So, uh, and in the in the past, uh, people used the uh, hafnium tetrachloride uh, here, and the appearance is solid. Uh, it is not preferable in the canister. On, uh, how to sublimize the this precursor into the gas phase is very difficult. And then we have to grow this uh, 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 this uh, hafnium precursor in 500 degrees Celsius. It is good actually, but but uh, the byproduct is uh, uh, corrosive because hydrogen chloride or uh, chlorine containing byproduct will be uh, corrosive to the substrate surface. Uh, after that, people change the uh, half new tetrafluoride into the uh, we call it estema or uh, tetra uh, ethyl methyl uh, amido. Uh, half new proposal. So, appearance really good, it's liquid and easy to vaporize into the gas phase, uh, but the LD process is uh, too low uh, because of the, the easily to decompose. And then uh, the people change one uh, amidoligan, the, uh, the alkyl amidoligan, with one cyclopentadienylican. And this introduction of one cyclican can enhance the uh, uh, the, the the LD temperature into the higher temperature. But uh, as you know that uh, the the semiconductor force is very aggressive, we will not pay in this in this precursor for a long time, and people will be aggressively innovate uh, the precursor molecule into the more higher uh, LD process temperature. By, by modifying the this structure of uh, LD compounds by linking this cyclican with the amidolican, we will form this this precursor. And then, and then uh, uh, in the study, I I I'm not only uh, modify this structure, but also modify the R group of this amidolican. It is uh, usually if we have a longer, we will have more stable. Uh, LD because of compound. So for TFT calculations, uh, the research I use the materials material studio with the model uh, code package, and then uh, I use the GGA and PDE uh, scheme correction, and I use basis set of uh, DNP, and then uh, we uh, also consider the FTD for the uh, long range interaction for the van der Waals, such as van der Waals interactions. So usually uh, in the chemical reaction, we will can we will uh, possible to uh, uh, to get the absorption energy and activation energy of the reactions and then reaction energy and then also disruption of the uh, reaction byproduct. So uh, in this in, in that study, I uh, use this tab, uh, this this. Uh, a variation of the structure where uh, one is the the conventional uh, CP half new 3 uh, compound and two is uh, the R group uh, is methyl and methyl and three is ethyl and methyl and then four is ethyl and ethyl. And just uh, briefly, uh, this is the result uh, by using thermolysis in simulations. We found that, sorry, this is three. Uh, compound three is the most stable with the ethyl and methyl, and then hydrosis re reaction uh, simulation uh, found that the compound two not be uh, is the most reactive one, and the surface reactions also show that these two and three is uh, more reactive than the compound one. Uh, now I will uh, discuss uh, more detail in the uh, uh, in the so in the thermolysis and hydrolysis reaction simulations, we have now here the activation energy. So showing here is the the activation energy of the compound two is the 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 more the highest one. It means uh, the the compound two is the the most stable, and then this one is the the lowest uh, activation. Uh, I mean the lowest activation energy is 
here so the, the, it indicates the compound two is the most reactive one so i will i will keep fast and simple for this result and then uh the dft study on the surface reactions uh also uh, stimulated by two uh, uh reactions uh between the amidolican and uh hydroxyl group on the surface and then uh we also simulated this uh, removal uh, uh, reaction of the uh, hydroxyl group with the CP is uh, uh, endothermic or unfavorable. That's why I just saw here that the, the amidolican reaction with the hydroxyl group. This is like the 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 the, uh, the looks for the energy diagram R to P one and then to P one to P two. There is uh, two activation energy here. And I used the uh, substrate model with a uh, uh, very large area, uh, at, uh, many atoms in the DFT simulation. It took uh, quite a uh, very long calculation time. And then uh, I compared only three compounds, which is the conventional one and com 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 compound two, which is the most uh, reactive one, and compound three, which is the most stable one. And then the surface reaction found that the compound two is the most reactive, and it is uh it agrees well with the uh the reactivity simulation using hydrolysis reaction. Uh, actually, we also have the experiment experimental result, but that is uh, confidential, and our result of the FT simulation is also agrees well with the experiment. And in the similar uh uh. Uh, strategy of the research. I also uh, uh, published uh, an article of the LD precursor development of the titanium precursors, uh, which is uh, similar, but uh, only success to synthesize with the methyl group in the link ligand for the titanium, but hafnium can obtain without methyl ligand. So I would like to summary uh, our my talk about this, uh, about my talk. Uh, I think ALD would be uh, an enabling uh, techniques to the more advanced technology, and ALD can meet the needs for the atomic layer control thickness using uh, and conformal deposition using a precursor sequential self-limiting surface reaction. So, uh, I also development of precursors and corrector uh, is also very important for the successful and innovative ALD process. And absolutely synthesized and precursor design uh, research is very crucial for developing LD technology for many applications. Uh, as uh, as you know that I published in uh, using DFT uh, study, uh, so I think the DFT uh, study or research uh, for developing the and designing a novel precursor uh, for better LD process is very also important. Before I end my talk, I would like to mention that there is a, a, a laboratory, which is my previous laboratory, my previous advisor as a laboratory. Uh, this this is the 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 website group uh, of group research, and you can look at this uh, website group research if you want to know the keyword. The keyword is. Uh, just making one journalist group in the uh, Google, you can find this uh, website. And then I would like to mention that there is a PhD opportunity in, in my uh, uh, previous advisor lab laboratory. Uh, we, we need the uh, uh, research, uh, I mean, uh, people to conduct the research about the atomic layer deposit deposition using the density function and theory calculations. And we uh, uh, we need the PhD for the PhD degree means uh, the requirement is master degree in chemistry or related majors. And also uh, absolutely we uh, uh, require uh, proficiency in English, both writing and speaking and understanding the design and synthesis of metal organic compounds. Also we don't, we don't, we will not use we will do, we will not do the synthesis in our in this laboratory, but uh, we will do much discussion with the chemical companies, several chemical companies in Korea, and absolutely the skills is uh, 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 patient for learning and research, and then uh, having publication in international or local academic journal. And uh, please contact me if there is a uh, students or participants is. Are interested to this opportunity.
and thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, if you have any question, please let me know. I will give to the moderator. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Romel, for the nice presentation about atomic layer deposition. And it is also about the computational chemistry. Uh, for the, all the audience, please, uh, you can ask directly, write in your hand and speak. Uh, or you can also write in the chat room of your Zoom meeting so that we can discuss all the things the speaker has presented before. Okay. Okay, uh, Professor Rommel, we're waiting for the question from the audience. Let me uh, ask some question from my side. And okay. you mentioned in your presentation that you use hafenium oxide material as the precursor for the ALD. And my question is, uh, is it possible or can we confirm the other metal, for example, pyruvate 3 or uh, metal oxide elements, so that uh, the material is also make the same precursor for the LD purpose? Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, please allow me to conclude so, your question is about can we use other uh, metal element precursor yes. for making uh, ALD of metal oxide? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I think it is very very possible for to do it because I not I I am here not doing the uh, developing hafnium precursors, but also titanium precursors, also uh, zirconium precursors, also silicon precursors, tungsten, cobalt, and ruthenium. So many precursors we we are evaluate. We have designed uh, for many many uh, materials and. Also, not only the the yeah, we know that uh, I I I present uh, the most simple uh, uh, materials, which is hafnium oxide, but but not only hafnium oxide, uh, we can also uh, synthesize the alloys uh, metal oxide uh, by ALD process. We we can discuss more if you are interested uh, about this one. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor Romel. And okay, please ask uh, to all the audience, including my students. And I think uh, Professor Romel has also invited you, the students, to continue and study the PhD program in Sejong. Any other his supervision? And but unfortunately, Professor Romel, we currently we are. Proposing the proposal for the development of our master program in chemistry, and we hope that next time we can also send our students to your laboratory to continue the PhD. Yeah, very nice. Okay. Uh, so, so I think that the question in the chat room. And, okay. I think it is enough, uh, Romel. I think uh, we can finish our. Uh, you don't need to remember the okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, and then uh, thank you very much uh, to listen my talk. If I do mistake or uh, misconduct, please uh, forgive me. And thank you very much for your attention. In making flexible devices. Thank you so much. And I want to ask the committee. Uh, the committee, shall we uh, deliver the certificate at this moment for the keynote speaker? That's the uh, age of exploration toward Mars. Okay, please. I'm not planning to make this before 2030. So, I mean, we need to bring so many stuff to the rocket. So, if the overall size, and overall weight of the device are left, then it is much easier uh, to bring the rest of the second percent that because the rocket second uh, will deliver the certificate of appreciation to Professor Romel after the presentation from the second percent that. 
Okay, uh, let's ask thank Professor Romel for his nice presentation by warm applause from the audience. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it was the presentation from Professor Romel from Sejong University. And now let us continue with the last uh, keynote speaker at this uh, moment. And I want, I would like to invite uh, Professor Halim Kusuma Maja, Professor of Physics in Durham University, and also hold an EPSRC Fellowship in Engineering. Uh, Professor Halim, uh, are you now available? Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. Us. Can you hear me? Much. Okay, Alhamdulillah, thank you. And before uh, listening his presentation, let me introduce him to all the audience. His name is Professor Kusma Maja. He graduated from, from Master of Physics from University of Leicester in 2004 and PhD in Physics from University of Oxford in, in 2008. Uh, he worked as postdoctoral research associate at Max Planck Institute of Colloid and Interfaces at the University of Cambridge. Before moving to Durham University and rising through the ranks from assistant professor to associate professor, and now he is full professor, starting from 2020. And Professor Kusmat Maja leads an interdisciplinary research group in area of soft matter and biophysics. Current research interests include wetting and interfacial phenomena, bio-inspired materials, liquid liquid phase separation in, in biology, multi-stable elastic structures, colloidal and molecular self-assembly, and high-performance computing. And now he will be presenting his presentation with the title of Manipulating Solid-Liquid Interaction via Surface Texturing. And uh, let's now uh, welcome uh, Professor Halim Kusuma Atmaja. Time is yours. Okay, great. Can I check that uh, you can see my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay, great. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I will start by uh, saying thank you for the uh, for the invitation and for um, giving uh, the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I hope um, the the voice and the video is uh, they are clear. Um, so I'm a physicist, uh, and, I, and I know this is a chemistry uh, conference. So I hope. There are, there are still some interesting messages that uh, you can gain uh, from it. So uh, what I would like to do today is to tell you some of the, uh, the work that uh, my group has been doing in the area of, uh, in a sense, manipulating solid liquid interactions. And this is done by, um, uh, by doing surface uh, texturing. So <clears throat> I think many of you probably uh, wouldn't really know where uh, Durham University is. So I'll, I'll start by uh, telling you uh, where um, where Durham is uh, in, in the UK. So we are in the northeast of England. So if you look, if you know the map of the United Kingdom, we are probably here that is highlighted in, in purple. So it's actually a, a small university a city. So it's, it's quite beautiful. Um, and in terms of the university, we are quite old. So we're the third oldest university in England. And in terms of ranking, we typically do quite well. So we are typically top five in the UK and then top 100 in the world. Um, and then we have several centers for doctoral training, uh, in particular in, in my area. So in soft matter, biophysics, renewable energy, and uh, what we call Global Challenges Research Fund, which is the idea where you're doing research to help developing countries. Um, so for those of you um, uh, who probably uh, want to know Durham from the lighter side, um, so uh, the people that like to watch football, so we are very close to Newcastle. So if you are a fan of Newcastle United, uh, we are very close to, to that club. Uh, we have also uh, been used for numerous uh, movies. So for example, uh, Harry Potter and uh, the Avengers have taken shots uh, around, around Durham. So uh, yeah, so that's a, a nice place. So hopefully uh, there'll be some opportunities for uh, some of you to come to, to Durham at some point. Now, in terms of my research group, um, uh, we are an interdis interdisciplinary uh, research group. And then there are three areas probably where we are focusing at the moment. So uh, we are looking at interfacial phenomena, problems in biophysics, 
and also thinking about high performance computing. So uh, the topic that I'm going to highlight today is primarily the work that we have done um, in the area of interfacial phenomena. So as you can see, you know, there are people in my group who come from Indonesia, but also from uh, uh, all other parts of the world. So we're not only interdisciplinary, but we're also uh, very international. Okay, now uh, let's get to the, uh, the topic of the presentation. So this is to do with uh, liquid solid interactions or more broadly wetting and interfacial phenomena. And to make sure we're on the, uh, on the same page, let me just uh, maybe review some of the basic concepts that you would need to, to follow my uh, presentation. So I just want to say a, a few slides about fundamentals of wetting and interfacial phenomena. Now, uh, there is this uh, beautiful quote uh, from uh, a Nobel Prize winner in the past, where um, Wolfgang Pauli said that God made the bulb and surfaces uh, were invented uh, by the devil. So if I can generalize this, I would probably argue uh, God made the bulk and surfaces and interfaces were invented by the devil. So, you know, there is nothing um, strange about this, uh, but what I think Wolfgang Pauli meant to say is that often if you're thinking about bulk properties in terms of physics and chemistry, they are often quite elegant and there is a simple way to understand this. Uh, but at the same time, if you're thinking about surfaces and interfaces, uh, I think a word that people often say is that it's messy, it's complicated many things are happening at the same time. Uh, so this is why it's, it's very difficult and it's still a, a work in progress, more or less. But, at the, you know, but it's really important to understand surfaces and interfaces because in almost all applications you can think of, surfaces and interfaces have to be there. So that's basically the, the boundary between your system and then you know, where you apply it you know, in, in the environment. So this is where you know, surfaces and interfacial studies become even, even more important as we make things smaller. So with the advent of nanotechnology, I think uh, it's even more important that we understand surfaces and interfaces. So uh, the first concept that um, we need to understand, the simplest one is the idea of surface tension. So uh, one way to think about this is that this is the work that must be done uh, to bring molecules from the bulk of the system, let's say a liquid, to the interface, right? So in terms of the, uh, in a sense, the energy scale, this will be energy per unit area. And maybe one way to think about this is that if you are a molecule and you are in the bulk of a liquid, you can see that uh, with the arrows that I have drawn here, you have many uh, interacting molecules surrounding you. However, if you uh, bring this particular molecule to the interface, you can see that uh, some partners where they, uh, they're initially interacting are now missing because now you have a different material. And as you move from the bulk to the interface, there is therefore some energy penalty that you have to overcome. And this is the notion of uh, surface tension, right? <clears throat> if you're thinking about uh, wetting or interfacial phenomena, typically there are several surface tensions that you have to think about. So one is the uh, interfacial tension or the surface tension between liquid and air and between solid and air and also between solid and liquid, right? So if you're thinking about, let's say a droplet sitting on the surface uh, where a droplet is a small um, spherical droplet of, of water, for example, then all these interfaces play a, a role at the same time, okay? Now, uh, one equation that is uh, able to describe um, this phenomenon is something called the uh, contact angle. So this is also known and like as the Young's contact angle. <coughs> and it says that <coughs> the angle of contact that this droplet will make will depend on this uh, three uh, surface tension or interfacial tension. And if you look at uh, the force balance, for example, uh, you can see that, you know, you can define this, this angle of contact. Now, if you think about this, um, depending on this angle of contact, uh, you can actually categorize this into different, um, in different, um, in a sense, uh, ranges. So the first one is when the angle of contact is zero. So that means the liquid really likes the solid. It basically wants to spread forever. Um, there is the case where it's the opposite, where the droplet is going to beat up completely. So that's actually a complete non-wetting. And in between, you can call this hydrophilic, where the... Um, liquid solid interaction is preferable compared to the gas solid, neutral wetting where it's basically uh, uh, equivalent, or hydrophobic when the gas interacts more favorably with the solid compared to the liquid, okay? 
So uh, in addition to contact angle, you can also think about this as a spreading coefficient, and then you can, you know, talk about uh, positive and negative spreading coefficient. But I think for our purpose, let's think about the contact angle instead of the, the spreading coefficient. Okay. Now, uh, let's think about uh, some uh, applications uh, that we might want to consider if we play with this idea of contact angle. Um, so <clears throat> the first thing to, to mention is that, you know, this idea of uh, solid liquid interaction about wetting interfacial phenomena, they are in underpinning science for a wide range of problems, right? So here, uh, we can look at uh, the ability of, uh, of an insect to walk on water. So this is a water strider. And this is only possible because the lack of the insect is really hydrophobic. So it doesn't like water at all. So it actually provides uh, enough lift force against gravity to allow this to, to walk on water. So if you're doing uh, laundry uh, fabric, so uh, you often have to deal with this idea of, of wetting. Uh, these days, everyone has a mobile phone. So uh, one of the first things that you probably do is to coat your screen with uh, basically um, some coating so that it, uh, it, it, it repels water. It's important for oil recovery. Of course, this is a multi-billion uh, dollar industry. Also, you know, paints and coatings and more and more recently, the idea of microfluidics, where you try to miniaturize operations of fluids at small scale this is where the interaction between the liquid and the solid becomes ever more important. So <clears throat> if we think about this, whether you want to be hydrophilic or hydrophobic, it really depends on the application. So um, one application uh, is when you spray pesticides, uh, let's say if you're in agriculture. So you want to make sure that your formulation is actually hydrophilic with respect to the leaves so that the uh, pesticides are actually absorbed uh, by, the, uh, by the plant. If you are thinking about uh, camera lenses, you probably want to coat the lens so that it's hydrophobic, so that when you actually try to take a picture, uh, when uh, there is rain, uh, the, the raindrops are not uh, basically blocking your lenses. Uh, if you are doing cleaning, you actually want uh, two things. So you want to make sure that the dirt or the soil is uh, not wetting uh, on the substrate, but if you spray your cleaning product, you want to make sure that cleaning product is hydrophilic, right? So therefore there is this idea that understanding the contact angle or the wettability is important. And there is a lot of effort uh, in the chemical industry to actually try to tune the formulation so you can exactly manipulate this idea of contact angle, whether you can make it more wetting or less wetting. <clears throat> now, the other concept that I want to mention, and this will become important in my talk, is, is the fact that uh, that idea of uh, Young's contact angle is really only applicable if you have a perfectly smooth surface. But we know this is not possible in reality. So there will always be um, uh, topographical uh, heterogeneity. So that actually, it just means that the surface is typically rough. You cannot really have an atomistically smooth surface. Uh, it's very difficult, especially for application, it's too expensive. You can also have chemical uh, heterogeneities that there are patches that are, you know, uh, of slightly different chemical where it's more hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Now, the outcome of that is that you can actually get uh, something that's called contact line pinning. So if you define the contact angle, typically the contact angle is actually not unique, but it's within a certain range. And the maximum uh, is called the advancing angle. So this is the maximum contact angle that you can typically see on a surface. And if you are above that, then the contact line will certainly move. There's also this idea of receding contact angle, which is the minimum of contact angle that you can observe. And because there is this range, and this is probably something that you see every day, if you, uh, if you look at your, your window or your, uh, you know, either your home window or your car window, if you have a, a small amount of rain, you will see that the droplet is actually stuck on the window, even though um, the window is tilted and gravity uh, should basically bring the droplet down. And that's actually the phenomenon that occurs because you have heterogeneities, you have contact line pinning, you have contact angle hysteresis, and that provides some sort of uh, pinning force or friction force that opposes gravity for the droplet. Okay, so that's another uh, concept that uh, in the past is a hindrance, but actually more and more people are actually taking uh, advantage of this uh, for applications. Now, <clears throat> I already mentioned briefly uh, the idea of wettability alteration. Um, so let's consider some examples. Um, so if you're thinking about laundry or oil recovery, 
essentially uh, you are doing wettability alteration because what you want to do, the challenge is that you want to replace one liquid by another. So in the context of cleaning, you replace the soil with your formulation liquid. In the context of oil recovery, you are replacing the oil that you want to get with either air uh, or you know, some sort of a uh, gas. Uh, and more importantly, often these days with some additional uh, liquid. So water mixed with surfactants and many things, right? Um, if we think about uh, applications in electronics or non-wetting clothing, uh, so let me just play this movie because it's quite fun. <coughs> you see that this is uh, basically some shirt and this shirt is actually super hydrophobic. You can see that you can actually manipulate uh, the surface so it's not wetting at all. Right. So the idea for this application is that it's not that you want to replace one liquid uh, by another, but you actually want to uh, manipulate uh, the surface so that it's more wetting or it's less wetting. Or in other words, whether the contact angle is going to be higher or lower. OK, so this is uh, some of the, the, the challenges. So it comes across as simple, but this is actually the foundation of many, many industrial products and processes. Now, what can we do? Uh, of course, the obvious thing is to use surfactants, especially if you come from a chemistry or chemical engineering uh, background. This has been done for, for a number of years. It has been extremely successful. And the idea of surfactant, if you're not familiar with it, is that you have uh, molecules which are typically amphiphilic. So uh, it, it looks a bit like that. So it typically has a hydrophilic, hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. And if you have, uh, let's say, emulsion of uh, uh, oil in, in water, the surfactant typically sits at the interface. And the net effect is typically to lower the surface tension. And by lowering uh, the surface tension, you actually make the contact angle uh, typically lower. So it becomes uh, more wetting. Um, so this is one way to, um, to manipulate uh, the, 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 the wetting behavior. Uh, this has been successful, but then, you know, recently, there is a drive to think about different strategy because surfactants are often not good for sustainability. Uh, some of them are not environmentally friendly. So there is a drive uh, towards thinking about more environmentally uh, friendly surfactants. So this is certainly an important area of research. Some surfactants are quite costly to produce and you use a lot of resources to produce surfactants. And perhaps another argument is that there is already a lot of surfactants that we produce every day uh, for different applications. So therefore, uh, there is this idea in basic research to ask the question, can you come up with a completely different strategy to do the same thing, to do well wettability alteration? Um, another very uh, successful strategy, uh, and you can see this uh, in your daily life, is to actually do chemical coating, right? So uh, perhaps one coating that I'm pretty sure everybody has in their home is actually Teflon. So if you think about your kitchen uh, utensils, uh, most of uh, your utensils are, uh, well, not most, but uh, quite a lot um, are coated by Teflon. And this is good because it makes the, uh, um, the material more hydrophobic. So things don't get stick basically. Uh, but of course, you know, a similar argument applies. Uh, so some coatings can be toxic and not environmentally friendly. And I guess the other argument is that if you do chemical coating, usually your solution is not really universal. So there is chemical specificity that is important. So it depends on what liquid or what materials you actually want to repel. Um, so what else can we do? Uh, and to do this, uh, we look into nature. So let me uh, uh, um, show you some um, strategies that uh, have been known actually for some time. So one strategy, uh, which is quite, uh, quite cute actually, is that um, in nature, many birds and mammals, uh, the way they clean is that they, uh, they dust bathe. So the idea is that if you actually cover yourself with dust, the particles, the dust particles will actually coat uh, the oil or the, you know, the things you want to remove. And because it's being coated by the dust, it's actually easier to remove, right? So in modern science, this is known as liquid marble. So there's this uh, nice movie over here that you can see. So you can see a droplet. And it hits this, um, <clears throat> this mountain of nanoparticle. So what you can see here is that as the uh, liquid droplet comes out, it's being fully covered um, 
by the nanoparticle and you will see immediately that the liquid droplet beats up right so it becomes more or less spherical uh, this is also known as um, liquid marble or uh, armored uh, liquid and this is very easy to remove because there's very little contact with the with the solid but of course you know in in reality this is often not uh, not so easy to to use uh, because you have to change uh, uh, consumer or human behavior it's very difficult to argue that if you want to clean yourself, what you need to do is to put lots of dust on you. So that's actually difficult. Uh, the other thing that uh, people have done is to actually use external field. So for example, this is the idea of electro wetting, where if you apply electric voltage between your droplet and the solid, you can actually manipulate how easy or difficult uh, a liquid is going to spread on the surface. And there are actually numerous applications, high-tech applications that people have done. Um, so this is the idea of using a display. So actually many of the uh, electronic paper products are using this idea where depending on the uh, voltage, this droplet can actually spread or beat up. And this allows different amount of light to pass through the pixel. So this allows you to actually uh, use it for display application. You can also use it as liquid lens where depending on the contact angle, you get different curvature of your uh, water all interface, and then you can use this uh, for lensing effect. Uh, but as I, I argue, uh, similar to the uh, dust bathing, this is also not practical in many applications because you need to have the electrodes uh, within the liquid. So this is often not, uh, not really feasible. So uh, the strategy that I want to uh, present today is something that is probably uh, easier to apply, but of course there are some challenges uh, with that. And it's the idea of uh, super hydrophobic or super omniphobic uh, surfaces. Now, um, again, we look into nature. So the idea is that, well, one way uh, to make, uh, uh, to manipulate the solid liquid interaction is to buy uh, manipulating the roughness of the solid uh, surface. So if you look at uh, natural materials and how rough they are, so it's actually ubiquitous. So many, um, many natural surfaces are very rough. So for example, this is the um, uh, uh, microscopy uh, picture of a, of a lotus leaf. So you can see it's extremely uh, uh, rough. And this is actually the property uh, that makes lotus leaf sacred in, in many countries because they clean themselves. So it's self-cleaning and it's because of this roughness. Uh, rose petal uh, is also very rough. And also uh, the, the butterfly wings, they're also very, very rough. Um, now, these are the natural uh, surfaces that people have observed. And of course, as physicists, chemists, engineers, we try to mimic them. So there have been some success in mimicking these various surfaces. This is uh, done in, in, in many ways now. So you can do 3D printing, you can also do lithography, or you can use you know, spray coating and things like that. And depending on the um, methods, some are easier, some are more difficult, but some are more controlled, some are less controlled. Okay. Now, um, so this is one movie that illustrates this idea of cell cleaning in super hydrophobic surface. So this is actually low to sleeve. And the idea is that if you have raindrops, water will actually fall down. And because it's non-wetting at all, as it moves, it basically takes away the dirt, the virus particle, and so forth. And this is one way to make the surface uh, clean by itself. This is the idea of self-cleaning. Okay. Right. <clears throat> and of course, it's not just self-cleaning. So super hydrophobic surfaces have uh, application in a wide range of, uh, of industry. So it goes all the way from... Uh, self-cleaning, anti-corrosion, all water separation, anti-icing, anti-fouling, anti-fogging, and these days medical devices. Mm -hmm. So this is a really hot area in, in terms of research into how do you make, um, how do you manipulate solid liquid interactions uh, by surface uh, texturing. Now, um, one thing that people are also notice is that the pattern that you have on the surface matters. So sometimes you have pattern that looks more or less isotropic, so you can't really tell if you look at in different direction, uh, you know, the, the roughness is more or less similar. You can also get parallel grooves like in rice leaves. So this is actually one way to direct the motion parallel to the groove, but difficult to move perpendicular to it. You can also have uh, ratchets. So with ratchets, uh, droplet only move in one direction, but not the other. 
So for example, this is exploited by butterfly to make sure that if um, raindrops fall on its body, it comes out, but it doesn't go into the body, which makes flying more difficult for the butterfly. Now, the particular structure that I'm going to um, uh, talk a bit more is actually to do with, um, with springtails. But before I, I, I explain that, uh, there is a, an important side note I want to highlight here because many work in this area is inspired by nature, by you know the idea of biodiversity. And Indonesian biodiversity is, of course, one of the richest in the world. Uh, but actually, this is not exploited. So there is hardly any work that looks at Indonesian biodiversity and how it has exploited surface patterning to manipulate liquid-solid interaction. Uh, so this is unknown. So in case there are some of you who are interested in that direction, I think this is a really good opportunity. Okay, now the springtail. So this is the, um, I guess, the inspiration I want to say a bit, uh, a bit more uh, today. So springtails are hexapods, so they're a bit like insects. So they, they live in a, in a wet environment. So they, they dwell in soil, uh, leaf litter, and on generally very, very wet environment. But it's important that they have um, a porous skin uh, to allow uh, for a diffusion of uh, gas. So essentially for breathing. Um, and that way it has to maintain an air layer between its body and the wet environment. And the way uh, the springtail has done this is by having these really beautiful structures on top of its body. So you can see this very complicated structure. And this has been uh, reproduced actually in the lab. Uh, so this was published in Science uh, a few years ago by uh, a group in the US, in UCLA. And what they tried to produce is essentially a structure that looks like uh, a bit like a nail. So you can see that this is the uh, basically the pillar and there is something on top where you have the, the plate there, and there's also this uh, little uh, bit at the edge. And this is what's giving rise to something called a reentrant geometry. So this part, the small part is actually quite important. <clears throat> now, uh, this idea of um, springtail is really interesting for the community because if you think about surface roughness and the interaction with the liquid, there are actually two possibilities that can happen. So the first one is that where liquid is suspended on top of the corrugation, so it's a bit like if you stand on top of a bit of nail, so you can actually be suspended on top of the nails. So that's actually really good for application because you have very high contact angle, you have low contact angle hysteresis, and you also have large slip length. So in other words, you actually have very, very uh, small friction. Whereas if your liquid is penetrating the corrugation, this is actually bad because you have high contact angle, so that could be good, but you have large hysteresis and small slip length. In other words, your friction is very large. So this is often undesirable. Now, uh, for many standard superhydrophobic surfaces, uh, you know, normal surface patterning doesn't cut it. It doesn't work <coughs> because you often go to this collapse state. Uh, and this geometry based on the springtail is good because it improves the stability of this Cassie-Baxter state. And this can be important for different applications. So for example, for marine shipping, where you want to have robust drag reduction. Uh, and this is difficult because often you have high pressure from the fluid flow. So you want to have something that is you know, very robust. Alternatively, um, for some applications like in electronics, uh, the liquid involved often has very low surface tension. And this is difficult for standard superhydrophobic surfaces. And you need to do something, something special like this springtail geometry. So um, this is one study that has been published um, comparing uh, just simple roughness where you just have a simple pose and this idea of uh, a pose and a bit of a plate at the top and this something called uh, doubly reentrant. So uh, another way to describe this is it's like a Times New Roman T uh, in terms of the shape. Now let's look at this picture here when you're comparing these three types of geometry. If you're thinking about something that looks like that, this is a good uh, liquid repellent uh, uh, structure for liquid that has high surface tension. So you look at uh, basically the green line. So it, it works quite well. But then as soon as the uh, liquid surface tension is around 45 or so, it basically drops to zero, which is really bad. Right? So you, you lose all the liquid repellency. If you think about uh, this geometry here, you can maintain liquid repellency up to a surface tension around 20. 
Whereas if you do this doubly reentrant, which is actually the, the structure that you see in springtail, you can actually maintain the quilt repellency all the way to about 10 micronewton per meter. So this is really fantastic, right? So this is why the sort of geometry is really interesting. And what is also important to say is that um, you do not actually manipulate uh, the chemistry. So you use uh, more or less the same chemistry, uh, but you just manipulate the structure. Now, so we have this uh, collaboration uh, with an industrial partner, so Procter & Gamble. So uh, they were interested uh, on this uh, doubly reentrant geometry. And um, the thing that they were asking us is that, well, if we want to design an optimal uh, structure, what should we consider? So there are a few that, that we then uh, thought uh, to be important. So the first one is the idea of hysteresis. Uh, in other words, uh, the friction uh, that the, um, the structure will influence on the, the, the liquid. The second one is the critical pressure. So what is the pressure that you can apply on the liquid such that the suspended state is maintained? And the final one is the idea of energy barrier. So the idea is quite similar to critical pressure, except the fact that you know perturbation uh, for the liquid can happen not just through pressure, but through other things. So for example, you can have vibration, you can have dynamic flow, you can have electric field and, and things like that. So energy barrier is a, a general concept to think about what is the um, energy input that you have to apply so that you overcome uh, the barrier to go from the suspended to the collapsed state. The higher the barrier, the better. So the details here are, are, are quite uh, a lot. So I'm going to uh, go relatively quickly, but if you're interested, you know, feel free to, to ask me later. So uh, with the hysteresis, what we have done is that we look at carefully how the interface is advancing or receding as let's say a liquid droplet is moving across uh, this sort of structure. And what we have found is that there are many uh, possible mechanisms uh, for the motion of the contact line. So we are able to enumerate all of them using a computational method. And we can also look at uh, the, uh, the contact angle hysteresis. So the maximum, the difference between the maximum and the minimum contact angle. And then we can also look at what uh, structural properties that uh, mostly influence this idea of contact angle hysteresis. And we find that mostly depends on the area fraction. So the area fraction of the top of the pose compared to the uh, periodicity and also the depth of this lip over here, okay? So we can understand that. We can also look at the critical pressure. And as it turns out, there are different mechanisms uh, for the breakdown of uh, super hydrophobicity. So in one case, the interface curve until it hits the bottom and the breakdown happens. And in another mechanism, you actually get the spinning um, from the lip before touching the base and then liquid basically penetrate the corrugation and we find that that mostly depends on the pillar height as well as the area fraction. So we can uh, look at that and then we can even uh, compute what is the boundary between these two failure mechanism. And similar uh, to this uh, um, uh, critical pressure, we can also look at the energy barrier. So I think the physics is quite similar. There are two mechanism where one, um, uh, uh, mechanism is when the interface first touch the bottom uh, base surface and the other is when the breakdown sits from the uh, from the side and we can compute the, the energy barrier and how it depends on the various properties of the structure. So the detail is quite complex, but what I really want to get to is that if you really try to optimize the structure, it, it turns out that the optimization is, is antagonistic or in, in other words, there is no free lunch that if you optimize one, you basically make things difficult for the other. So uh, for example, uh, if you want to increase the critical pressure, um, one thing that you can do is to can increase the, the cap width. So that's good because this is uh, you know, higher critical pressure. But what that means is that your hysteresis also goes up. So that's not good for your application. Uh, alternatively, you can make the whole system size smaller. So that's good for critical pressure but you will make the energy barrier uh, for collapse to be smaller. So that's also not, uh, not good. So <clears throat> uh, one strategy that we have done, and I think this is quite general, is that we can think about uh, optimizing the structure 
uh, by adapting something called genetic algorithm. So this is um, uh, adapting the idea that uh, in nature, uh, things are evolving. Uh, so the idea of genetic algorithm is that uh, we can actually um, uh, study uh, structures that look similar, but we play around with the parameters. And then we, let's say, look at 20 of them, 10 or 20 of them. And then we pick, we pick the best performing one. So let's say we pick the best five. And then what we do is that we mix the parameters that make this uh, five candidates promising. We also do a bit of mutation. So it's a bit like when you are evolving, you know, um, uh, you know, there are, um, when, when parents have children, their genes are a bit mixed and there's also mutation. So we're mimicking this process. And then by doing this, we can actually come up with the ideal structure that, that we ideally want to have if we, can, uh, if we can have a behavior where the pressure is really high, the energy barrier is really high, but friction is very low. And what's really quite uh, cool, quite nice for us is that when we do this, the optimized geometry turns out to be very similar to the springtail geometry. So here we have done large scale uh, computational calculations to optimize this. But as it turns out, our solution is quite similar to what nature has uh, basically manufactured uh, many, many, uh, you know, uh, thousands of years ago. So somehow this idea of evolution is there that, you know, the structures that you see in nature may, might not be there by chance, but they are actually there to manipulate the interaction between liquid and solid. So I think this is a, a really nice message to, to have, I think, for us as scientists. Okay. Now, the second uh, story I want to uh, highlight today is this idea of liquid infused surfaces. So again, uh, we, we look into a nature for inspiration. So uh, some of you that like to go to the botanical garden uh, might know this plant. So these are called pitcher plants. So these are carnivorous uh, plants that actually eat insects. So um, these are two movies. So here you can see when the environment is dry, the ants can actually move around quite nicely on the, on the pitcher plant. But if the environment is dry, you can see that the surface becomes very slippery. And this is actually the mechanism for the pitcher plant to get its meal. So this is called aqua planning, right? So uh, this makes the surface very slippery. The, the ants actually fall down and then unfortunately it gets eaten by the plant. Now in terms of biomimicry, uh, so we typically don't do the ants, so we, we do a, a droplet, uh, but you can also look at you know, a small particle so uh, instead of the insect, I'm thinking about, let's say, a water droplet. And then whether the environment is dry or wet, I replace this with a lubricant, typically an oil. And I have a gas surrounding. And to trap the lubricant or the oil, I need to have a, a solid substrate that is typically corrugated, porous, generally rather relatively complex, so that capillary forces can keep the lubricant uh, sitting uh, in, on the surface. OK. Now, um, the key feature is that the surfaces, the surface is very slippery, and this has a multiple applications. So, um, so I'm based in the UK, in, in England, and we here eat a lot of ketchup, right? So uh, one of the problems that you often have with liquid packaging is that at the end of the uh, product lifetime, you get stuck. So there are materials that cannot come out, and this is basically product loss. Whereas if you make your surface very slippery, you can actually avoid this problem. This is a really nice uh, movie uh, from the group in Harvard, from Joanna Eisenberg. So the idea here is that you can do this for anti-gravity, uh, uh, basically, wall. So this is a normal surface, and this is this uh, liquid infused surface. So you see that because the surface is very slippery, you can spray anything you want, but it won't stick, right? Uh, so this is, again, coming back to this idea of uh, self-cleaning and so forth. Uh, Another application is anti-biofouling. So if you work uh, in applications that involve putting things inside the sea or inside water, after a while, you often see uh, biofouling where there are organisms that attach to your structure and that's really bad for um, the lifetime of the product and for performance. And here there's a table that compares uh, the amount of biofouling uh, comparing basically what is typically done against one of these surfaces. So you can see that there's very little um, anti anti very little biofouling if you use this super slippery uh, surfaces. Now, what I want to do uh, in this talk is a bit different. 
<clears throat> so I want to address a slightly different challenge, which is to uh, manipulate the motion of droplet by surface patterning. Um, so again, uh, this is by inspiration. So um, this is a Namibian uh, this desert beetle. So the, the, sub, the, the surface of the, the beetle has hydrophobic and hydrophilic patches. And this is quite amazing because uh, the hydrophilic patch is there to condensate water. And when the water droplet is big enough, it starts to hit the hydrophobic patch. That makes the droplet moves easier. And what is even more impressive is that it, uh, it basically designed the substrate somehow by evolution, presumably, so that water droplet goes from the body to its mouth. This is actually a drinking mechanism. Now, of course, what we want to do in application is that you might want to do surface patterning uh, so that you can do open microfluidic devices where you can control uh, liquid motion uh, at small scale using wettability as a way to confine the motion. Now, current strategy where you are patterning the solid has a problem because friction is very high typically. So the idea that uh, my group and others want to do these days is that we want to combine the idea of surface patterning with the ability to put liquid on top of solid soft surface, on top of solid surface to actually reduce the, the solid friction. <coughs> okay. Now, um, of course, this idea of wet ingredient is not um, um, totally new. Um, but as I said, you know, there are challenges with the current strategy. This is why our strategy could be quite interesting. So this is uh, a very old strategy uh, from the group of George Whitesides in Harvard, where they put chemical patterning. You can see you can drive the motion up the hill against gravity. This is a strategy using super hydrophobic surface where you put different um, fraction of solid. Uh, but actually, uh, this doesn't allow motion uh, straight away because there are friction, there are pinning. So what you need to do is to vibrate the droplet uh, and a combination of the vibration and this um, gradient in solid surface allows the droplet to move. And then the other uh, strategy is by taking advantage of Leiden force drop, where you actually hit the where you where you hit the substrate where you hit the substrate such that there is a vapor layer underneath the droplet. And because there is no contact between the droplet and the solid, the friction is, is low, okay? So of course, these uh, strategies are not really practical because here friction limits droplet motion, whereas here it's often not practical to have a substrate that is really hot. But what we want to mimic is again, rather than having a gas layer, we're wondering if we can actually put a, a liquid layer to reduce the friction uh, um, so that friction is limited. So this is one, uh, one thing that we have done. So what we do is that we do a dual length scale uh, corrugation plus lubrication to allow this. So look at the inset uh, over here. So what we do is that we put a, a micron scale texture that you can see in the inset. And on top of the micron scale texture, there are also nanoparticles that are dispersed in the system. So these are not drawn here, but um, there are actually nanoparticles surrounding it. And then we also put a small amount of uh, lubrication layer, so a small amount of liquid. So that's actually what you see um, in yellow. So the idea is that the, um, the, the liquid layer, uh, uh, the lubrication will follow the micron scale corrugation, but then the lubrication is trapped um, in terms of the shape by using the nanoparticle. And this allows us to maintain uh, what looks like this Cassie-Bacter state. Remember the first story that I told tell you, except now there is actually another liquid um, that is mediating the interaction between the droplet and the solid. Okay. Now, this is uh, one of the results that we have got. So for example, if you do the same system, but without the lubrication layer, without the liquid, if you actually have the case where the micron scale texture has a gradient, so um, there is more solid um, basically here compared to there. If you don't have the lubrication layer, then the droplet cannot actually move very much because the, the friction is, is high. Whereas if you have this lubrication layer, it can reduce the friction in such a way that the droplet can move many, many times its body, right? So the idea here is that um, if you have a bare surface without the liquid, 
uh, you actually have weak driving force compared to the friction. Whereas if you have this lubrication, you reduce the friction so much that your um, wetting gradient is enough uh, to actually propel the droplet, okay? And there are some also uh, additional advantages. So for example, here we show that we can drive um, the droplet motion up the hill against gravity, uh, which is difficult if you don't have the, the liquid layer. <clears throat> uh, this is a comparison between droplet bouncing um, if you don't have the lubrication compared to uh, the, the easy capture uh, when you have this uh, liquid layer. And for example, this could be interesting if you want to have applications uh, to do with uh, raindrops harvesting, or you want to maintain the droplet to sit there uh, from fog, for example. Uh, and I guess to demonstrate that uh, this has stronger adhesion, uh, we can actually do this idea that the droplet motion can be done upside down, whereas if you have a normal, let's say, super hydrophobic surface with uh, small friction, this will typically just detach, right? So this is uh, one of the ideas that, that we are uh, pursuing uh, further. Now, of course, <clears throat> um, there's a question, um, how big is this area? So I just want to mention that um, IUPAC, which is the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry, um, I think just last year, uh, basically highlight 10 uh, in chemical industries that are uh, basically on the way up, that is really promising. And um, what I'm talking today is typically grouped under super wettability, is basically the idea that you manipulate the solid liquid interaction, the wettability of the solid with respect to liquid in such a way that it has super behavior. So this could be super hydrophobic, super hydrophilic, uh, you know, very low friction, uh, very slippery, super slippery, and, and things like that. Okay. Now, uh, so those are just the two main things that I want to highlight, but let me let me illustrate that there is really a lot of work to be done. And I just want to have a, a quick tour of the other things that we are doing in the group. And hopefully this also inspire some ideas from the audience. Maybe this is a, an interesting direction you want to go uh, in the future. So here uh, we're working uh, with some experimental colleagues to actually design liquid diodes. So the idea is similar to uh, electronic diodes where um, in electronic diode, you have um, current that can flow in one direction, but not the other. So this is one of the fundamental electrical component. Uh, the idea here is that we want to design liquid diode where liquid can only flow in one direction, but not the other. And what is even more unusual in this project is that we have inspiration from flea. So this is a bug that you often want to get rid of, but actually in its uh, reproduction organ, there is this interesting structure that means that uh, certain uh, bodily fluid can move in one direction, but not the other. And we are trying to uh, mimic this using 3D printing. And what you can see here is that if we have this structure, we actually put liquid in the middle. I think it's pretty obvious that it's moving to the right, but it basically blocks motion altogether to the left. So this is a demonstration where you can actually have this diodic behavior. Um, uh, with another colleague, uh, so this one is in Durham, uh, we are playing with uh, mesh, uh, like mesh like structures to actually uh, think about rain harvesting. So this could be interesting uh, in areas where clean water is a problem. So it's inspired by this, um, I guess this plant, I mean, this is something you see every day where if you have a plant structure, even though there are holes, uh, you can actually block liquid to penetrate the, um, the structure. Uh, so I hope you can you can see that. And then the idea here is to then think about what is the best way to design the mesh structure so we can manipulate the direction of the of the liquid. Uh, so we might be able to collect it. Another idea is that this could be interesting for architectural design because you can stop rain to fall down, but you still allow air to breathe uh, between your basically your home, your office, and the surrounding. <coughs> And another application that we're thinking still to do with this super wettability uh, area is capture. So this is actually another industrial project with ExxonMobil, where um, remember uh, the second story I told you about super slippery surfaces and liquid infused surfaces where you can actually trap lubricant inside a, a solid corrugation. So the idea here is a bit different. They want to use the same um, uh, idea, the same idea of capturing uh, liquid on a solid structure, 
but instead of exploiting the whole thing to make you know things super slippery, they want to use the liquid that is trapped for chemical reaction. And of course, the big problem now is carbon capture. So you might be able to trap liquid like liquid amine uh, that actually has good interaction with uh, with carbon dioxide. And then if you pass, let's say, a flue gas that has lots of carbon dioxide, it might be able to capture it. So this is actually a technology that we are uh, helping um, this major industrial company to, to develop. So I think uh, that's probably where I will stop today. Um, so I think I've said a lot. Uh, hopefully there are some interesting questions from the audience, but um, if you do not remember anything I say, I hope you can uh, share these three points uh, with me. So I hope you see that wetting and interfacial phenomena are really fun and they are very relevant from your everyday life experience in the kitchen, in your car, all the way to the latest technology. So we're thinking about, you know, uh, carbon capture, we're thinking about water harvesting and all those things. So I hope you share the view that surface texturing is an effective means uh, to manipulate sol solid liquid interaction. Uh, so I'm just talking about this too, uh, that you know we've worked a lot, but you know I also show some other possibilities. And I guess this is something I always emphasize when I give a talk in Indonesia, because in the community, uh, a lot of uh, um, the field is driven by bioinspiration. And in Indonesia, we have rich biodiversity, but as Indonesian scientists and engineers, I think we haven't tapped this potential. So if you happen to like chemistry, physics, but somehow you also have passion on biodiversity, maybe this is something you want to think about uh, in the future. So thank you very much for listening. And then if you have uh, comments, questions, suggestions, um, I'm very happy to, uh, uh, to take them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Halim. Uh, it was very interesting and inspiring to talk from you about uh, nature and the technology for nature and how we mimic the nature. And now we can go to the question answer session uh, from the audience here. Please, time is yours. Mr. Deskiveri. I hope that I can. Yeah. Oke, okay, Pak Halim. Ya, yeah. uh, <laughs> Pak Deski. This is such a wonderful talk, ya. Yeah. Uh, from the from the, the slide you share, it is about the wonderful wonderful uh, waiting, ya, yeah, from the waiting uh, phenomenon in nature give us and learn and we can learn from nature. So this, this that, that was what what you talk about. Uh, my question, uh, this reminds me about the, about the lectures was given by Professor Ozin uh, a couple of years ago uh, from Toronto University. So uh, he inspired us when I was, um, when I was young at the time. So uh, he gives us the, uh, the inspiration about the perpetual motion, perpetual machines, yeah, perpetual machine from the super high, super hydrophobicity. So in his lecture, he was telling about how water could be uh, could flow upward, yeah, could flow could, could flow upward uh, due to super hydrophobicity, yeah. So uh, he lecturing us about how to modify the surface, the surface of the materials, and then uh, we design the super hydrophobicity. So uh, the water can flow upward and then downward, upward, downward, upward. So something like that. So it's become a, it's become it's against the uh, thermodynamics law, but it is possible. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, uh, I want to ask you to clarify in which dimension we are talking about of this, this kind of structures. Is it in micro, micrometer scale? Is it nanometer scale? Or in which, in which dimension uh, we, are, we, 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 we are talking about this, uh, this structure? Thank you very much. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so thank you for the, the question. So. Um... So surface tension is uh, primarily uh, dominant um, if you are typically about uh, one millimeter and below, because you want to have the behavior where surface tension 
dominates um, over, you know, let's say gravity. And there is something called the capillary length that is typically about some uh, millimeter. So if you are in this regime, then for sure surface tension dominates everything. Um, and in a way you can argue that, uh, well, for many you know, uh, macroscopic uh, uh, applications, you don't have to think about this, but I have two comments on that. So one is that with the advent of nanotechnology and microtechnology, what happens at you know, the millimeter scale and below is becoming more and more important. So there are things that that's the dominating physics anyway. So in dominating chemistry, but there are also evidence that, you know, even though, uh, you know, wetting primarily affects things at, um, at the millimeter scale, but what typically can happen is that it affects the, the boundary, basically the, the boundary condition of your, of your system. And boundary uh, of your system can in turn actually affect the, um, the bulk uh, behavior. So uh, one example I want to provide here is probably in the context of, um, uh, let's say in industry transport, where you might think, okay, so uh, solid friction um, is actually happening only at the solid liquid boundary. And what it turns out is that if you can actually uh, improve uh, the solid liquid interaction uh, in transport, for example, in fast ships, you might be able to save uh, fuel by a few percent but then if you save this by only a few percent, but which might be you know, small, this is still many billion dollars, right? So sometimes people think, okay, it is just a small effect because it just happens at the boundary. But if you actually do the economics, this is still a lot of money. So that's why people should care. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Mr. Leskiberi and Professor Halim. And I think uh, we have, uh, we can conclude and we can finish our session with Professor Halim. And before finishing this uh, session, I would like to invite the organizing committee to deliver the certificate of appreciation to our keynote speakers, Professor Romel and Professor Halim Gusmat Maja. Okay, uh, yes. And this is the certificate of appreciation for Professor Romel Hidayat. And this is, and the second certificate will be given to Professor Halim Kusuma Atmaja. Okay, and we okay, okay. Uh, by uh, the delivery of certificate, we can finish our uh, session with keynote speaker. And it is time for me to leave this chair, and I will hand in this session to the organizing committee. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah wabarakatuh. Thank you. <clears throat>
Ladies and gentlemen, back to me as master of ceremony. Tari Piring is a traditional dance that displays attraction using plates. Presenting Minang Kago culture, please enjoy the performing of West Sumatra traditional dance, Tari Piring.
Ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of the first day of the conference. We would like to thank you for spending your time with us today. For your information, the parallel session will be held tomorrow at 8 p.m. until 12 p.m. Western Indonesia time. Thank you very much for your attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.